You're listening to Find the Good News, Episode 21, The Music Box, featuring Paul Gonsalon. This episode of Find the Good News is sponsored by Parker Brand Creative Services, a branding agency that thinks sideways, pushes forward, and gets your brand up. Check out our work at parkerbrandup.com. Would you like to help make sure I'm asking my guests the really good questions? Just visit findthegood.news and click the questions tab. I'll see if I can get your question dropped in the fishbowl. Each episode, my guests will dive deep, select three random questions, and if yours is selected, I'll ask it on the show. That's findthegood.news. Before Paul arrived to visit me on Find the Good News, I could not have imagined the quality of the conversation we would have nor the variety of things we would have to talk about. I met Paul years ago while volunteering time with the Southwest Louisiana Arts Council, and while we had a friendly rapport, I wouldn't have said at that time that we were really good friends. We were more like friendly acquaintances. It's amazing how serious listening and good conversation can change things. It had been years since I'd spoken to Paul, and my only real exposure to him during that time had been from afar while filming local music events and festivals. When I inadvertently contacted Paul, I had actually been trying to reach out to the new 1950s cover band, Crybaby, to see if a band member would like to come on the show and talk about the joyful sounds they've been bringing to the good people of the lake area. As it turns out, it was an auspicious thing that Paul happened to be that band member, and as it ends up, we had a lot more to talk about than music. If you listen to this show, you probably know by now that a recurring theme is transformation, change, and the hard work, experimentation, and even pain that it takes to turn the dial on your life in a positive direction. That's exactly what Paul has been doing these years since I last spoke to him. He's been changing his life, his mind, his habits, and his thinking. He's been doing the work, experimenting, and transforming past pains and anxieties into something good. In fact, I don't think I'd be going too far to say that he's learned to let much of that pain go. The man that was sitting across from me is passing on the good work shared with him through counseling. He's used those shared works to step on the path to awakening, becoming a counselor himself, passing on what he's learned, and adding new insights along the way. It seems to me that Paul is taking a whole life view, incorporating everything into his journey, from his lifelong love of music, with special favor given to the Beatles, to Vipassana meditation. I may have accidentally contacted Paul Gonsalon when looking for a little musical good news to share, but what I got was even better than good news. He challenged me, and it was good to push through and gain some new clarity on some things in my life. In visiting with Paul, I feel that I've had a conversation with another human being that, as Paul might put it, will have a durable benefit in my life. Wake up this morning you're dreaming up a story I can hear The way it's going Cause you're laughing in your sleep On the path to your deliverance And a holy wall of light Pouring through your window Old news, bad I'm news, happy. fake news Sometimes Help you just want to shut it all I down And get no news at all With Find the Good News, I aim to change that by focusing on good people doing good work. I visit with artists, educators, civic and spiritual leaders, musicians, business owners, students, volunteers, and everyday citizens who are using their creativity, resources, and talents to bring hope and happiness to their corner of the world. In each episode, I dig into the hearts and minds of my extraordinary guests. We have street-level conversations about relatable things going on in their lives, discover the critical life experiences that shape them, the perspectives that drive them, and the fundamental beliefs that are anchoring them to a path of goodness. There's a lot of news in the world. My name is Orrin Parker, and I'm going to find the good. And I love you just. that people were have started using this as a way to pat someone on the back hmm. you yeah know? yeah 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 as i've thought about coming in that's something i've thought of it's like how many people am i so grateful for and, you know we were already talking about them people yeah. like erica yeah Creedy are like wow like she's amazing i'm so glad that i had time with her you know as a person and as a co-worker and as a boss yeah so I imagine as you keep interviewing people, 
you'll just get more ideas and names of people to interview. Yeah. Just build. Yeah, it's different for me because, you know, working in marketing, it was like most of the time you're trying to draw attention on something, most of the time, uh, with some kind of financial outcome. You know, where there, there's an increase in sales or an increase in customers, whatever it may be, or growing a brand. And that's there's nothing. Well, I'm saying there's nothing wrong with that. That's the job. Right. I'll say it that way. <laughs> that's the job. And it is what it is. I like you know? that better. <laughs> <laughs> that's the job. And that's what people expect of that. And we, we do that. Okay. So, but that doesn't always mean it's always a good thing. And then the other thing about it is, a lot of um well i mean i've got stacks of magazines you know that have somebody on the cover Mm -hmm. and i started kind of for myself started seeing myself tune out to that kind of thing because i kind of knew not that the people aren't good people or that they're not interesting because they are but i started finding that i i think my advertiser's brain started overriding my the other sensibilities i have and would go well they chose that person because they're popular now people are aware of them it's a good for their magazine exactly so i was like well with this i don't want that i'm trying to break that not not break those things those things can be that you know Mm -hmm. but uh this isn't about who's on the cover although there is somebody on the graphic you have to tell people who they're less who who they're about to meet but just like you said it's like being grateful for the people that maybe are unsung a little bit right and a lot of these people who have come on people know them and so they are song heroes, you yeah. know, yeah. well balladed. But uh, <laughs> I don't know. I think that he, as it grows and as time goes on, um, we'll get out of those big tri- and big streams and start getting into those little tributaries. Cool. And we'll find people that and I'm already seeing that with the suggestions. You know, people will go, well, I know this lady who um, she's raising her her grandchildren as her children because both their parents passed away. And, you know, she does this and she does this. Well, on on a community level we maybe wouldn't sing that Mm -hmm. but on that microscopic level that matters like in that universe of those children's world yeah ultimately the impact would be great that those children have a nurturer absolutely so that kind of stuff is what i'm hoping to see blossom you know to spread out cool but anyway you're 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 interesting for me and i'll tell you why Mm -hmm. so when I reached out to you, I didn't know I was reaching out to you. Yeah. <laughs> I did that. Because, yeah. <laughs> okay, so here's the story. I'll tell you this real quick. I, when I was a kid, I can remember the first time I ever heard 50s music. Mm. And I'm just going to call it that as just a broad blanket sure. statement. I know that's sure. all over the place. But my mom would listen to that when she cleaned house. And so I was always around that when I was a kid. Well, as I got older and as and a teenage, as a teenager, I still listened to that music. And so people would buy me these big cassettes, you know, like the greatest hits of the fifties, and I would listen to that stuff all the time in my car. Mm-hmm. And my kids to this day laugh at me because they're like, "You know the words to every one of these songs." Yeah. And I said, "Well, that, to me, those were singable songs." Like, I don't think, for me, again, just my own life, I don't find that as much now, singable songs. Okay. You yeah, know? I hear that. But those were singable songs. Like, they made me feel good when I sing them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, yeah, there were similarities across the whole that whole decade there, but uh, there was something important to me about that, the joy of it. Yeah. And so when I, st- my first uh, high school girlfriend, I went over to her house and her brother was playing uh, Dion in the Belmonts. Mm-hmm teenager in love yeah okay okay so i go online and someone had i guess it was a video clip of this band crybaby in late charles singing teenager in love and that's one of my favorite songs cool and yeah. i was like okay selfishly i gotta get this somebody from this band on this show yeah because i just want to talk to him about why y'all chose to do that well then you come back sure i'm like oh i know you I had no idea you know, yeah, I couldn't tell from the video that that was you and the band. So that's how this happened. Kind of cool for me. Yeah, and that's why we're here. Yeah, I, I really relate to that joy that you're talking about. There's something in that music that's joyful, innocent, and at the same time is radical. At the time, is super radical music. Sure, yeah. <laughs> blowing everyone's minds, you know. And for me, that still translates this kind of innocent 
toughness about it that I think really is very cool. And we're oh, so yeah. excited to be playing it. And um, people respond to the music. Really? You know? yeah. I was going to ask you that. Like, how how's the response been to that? Is it refreshing to people? You they, think? Yeah, they, they get excited about it. Well, um, we're brand new. That's something to know if anyone's listening. We're a brand new band. Like, how brand new? We've done three shows, and we've been playing for, I don't know, five months. Wow. Yeah. So, brand new. Um, but the reception so far is, is great. People's faces light up. That's a great thing from the stage. Yeah. When <laughs> someone like me, I've, I've got experience playing other music, but not music that's kind of rooted in joy yeah that's wonderful yeah so to see a to see people's faces kind of light up is is really cool yeah um the nostalgia of it the fact that it takes people way back sometimes like you and your story you're taken back sure and you're there yeah and now you're having new memories in that moment with your kids yeah that's so cool to me i love that about music yeah yeah, my son is he loves Earth, Wind, and Fire, and um, he's in band, and so they do perform. They, they did that for their um, their big show this year. And I was never a huge fan, but he's really like into that this their greatest hits album. You know, he's all September, you know, and all that. He's really into it, and so he's he when it comes on, he immediately goes, "I love this so much." And so I asked him, had that same conversation. I was like, "Why do you love it?" Mm-hmm. And it's interesting because it's not so much all about the music. As I talk to him, I'm like, you love it for what it's created. Mm -hmm. It's built a sound memory Mm -hmm. attached to pleasant memories of camaraderie and positive activity and the joy of performing. And and then he'll start talking about, yeah, the, the morning practices and then the sun rising up on the field and being wet. And I'm like, so your mind is taking all these things and building you like this little nest egg of joy and that song forevermore will capture that for him that's an awesome thing absolutely and then what it will also do is build into the future and it's likely that he'll take that song with him and carry it for the rest of his life yeah he'll just keep incorporating those things i have experiences with certain songs yeah where a lot of people will say this but a song that's great for me I can hear it now, today. Uh, And when I hear it now, it speaks to me in different ways than it did 10 years ago. But they're equally as meaningful. Mm -hmm. And the meanings are different. That's amazing. So I have this current moment with this song. I have the past, like your son is saying, where I have all these memories associated with it. And really, I'm carrying it along with me. And it's letting me know who I am. Yeah. That's amazing stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it's adding to. It's not just this one moment in time. I see what you mean. I have so, I have a song like that. Um and it's something I only fairly recently that it happened in the last 2 or 3 years, but um I guess at certain times a, a song will come along at the right time. Mhm. And so I had a, a place that I go every year for like a, a a private retreat just nothing it's no place special to anybody else but just a special place to me and i take a few days to go spend some time there and uh i've aged there and for me it's the place i've where i see myself change you know Mm. it's kind of like what you're describing i guess that's what makes me think of it is because you know i was 20 years old 20 21 when i when something happened to me there that really changed my life Mm -hmm. Well, I'm 44 now, so I've got 24 years of this going to this one place every year at the same time. And so I've watched the place change. Mm-hmm. It's actually, I'll just tell you, it's a cemetery. Yeah. And what's interesting is now, 24 years later, I do go to the same spots within that cemetery. But as the years went by, there's new burials there. The cemetery's grown. And it's almost like that song, like as this particular little girl that in this last 20 years who had passed away well her parents have like a a bench there Mm -hmm. and it's at the top of this little hill and i don't know one day when i was on one of these visits there i uh i don't know i just felt drawn to go sit over there i don't know her but it was just it was new and fresh so i go sit there and i had a music box that i had found at um goodwill and it was a little dancer girl, you know? And mm-hmm. so I thought, you know, I was bringing it to somebody else's grave, but I felt like I'll leave it here. So I sat there 
and I wound it up and I sat it down in her grave and I sat there in that chair and that song from that music box the wind blew through the trees all these little yellow leaves fell down it was the perfect temperature the time of day and it was just the way it all fused together Mm. well my wife and i went back this year and uh i walked over there and we sat on the bench together and i wound the music box up and so she was listening to it she goes and then the leaves blew through and she's like this is just like the perfect moment i said you know it's interesting i said i wonder if now that music box will also be fused in her memory as that Mm. moment in time so now for me when i I guess what i guess i'm getting at is that little song on that music box even though it came 20 year 24 years later is now a part of the history of that place for me and i'm it's it's a new little bent pin point right i don't know it's just and isn't it amazing how that little song you're i guess you're talking about like one of these little like key Keto. Yeah, and it just plucks the... Right, right. So imagine yeah. that, okay? Tiniest little instrument with these little notes. There couldn't have been that many notes. No, I mean, it's just got a few little... I don't know what their prongs right. or whatever. Yeah. But here's what's amazing for me. It's tiny. What is this? A few inches it was. Big. It's probably about two inches right? wide, yeah. So within that, these little things, little keys, little pieces of metal, is the ability to take you so deep into that moment. Yeah, isn't that something? And to connect with yourself, with this person who's passed away. And just those little notes did that. They really added so much richness to that moment. And that amazes me to think about because it's strange to consider. It really is how things... I think that, you know, and I'm jumping jump all over the place and sure. this just warning, but... uh the type of meditation that you do. The, mm-hmm. the, the, say it for me, please. This, Vipassana. The, oh, Vipassana. Okay. Mm-hmm. I was reading about it. Um, seeing and basically, I'm going to simplify it so people listening. I'd like to hear you talk about sure. it too. But um, seeing things as they are, plainly. Oh. Okay. There's a line from the movie Kundun that, uh, or not Kundun. What was it? Uh, it was seven years in Tibet or Kundun, one of the two, those movies get blended together for me, but the Dalai Lama is asking some of his, uh, the other monks to explain to him what's going on with the Chinese. Mm -hmm. And they were getting very passionate about it. They've done this and they've done this and they're in tears. And he, and he he stopped, he took a breath, he put his hand out. He said, plain information, please. Very calmly. And I love that scene Mm -hmm. because I'm like, yeah, plain information. And I'm not talking about sterilizing life, but when I heard that, I said, yes, that to me touched my heart in a way because I thought our passions and things can get so mixed up sometimes, sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse. But um, I guess getting back to the music box, that's plain information. When I'm in that, when you're in a place where you hear a song, it just gets absorbed purely. I'd rather absorb it purely Mm -hmm. than have it be absorbed when I'm in an emotional state Mm -hmm. or when I'm feeling something that's all over the place or I'm trying to sort through things. Mm -hmm. I'd rather hear or have that type of experience with a song in a place, in an environment, when I'm getting plain information. That way, when I do get in places in my life where those the roller coaster begins the ups and the downs mm-hmm. and the thoughts are just clouding your hit clouding things then when i hear that song it brings me back to a place where i can go okay this is this is plain and it's beautiful to yeah. be just vanilla plain not all this additional stuff tacked on yeah kind of cuts through i'm hearing a lot of stuff in that statement i'm hearing the connection between meditation and music is not a difficult one for me because like the music box it served a purpose and what you're telling me is it it gave me plain information it cut through my thinking my analyzing this place and what i'm doing here music can just really get through that Mm -hmm. and it can take you to an emotional place everybody knows that but it when it takes you to that place It's taking you out of another place. Sure, yeah, okay. Which was one that analyzes, is critical maybe, and does all kind of other stuff that gets really exhausting, right? Yeah. So there's your plain information. Vipassana does that. Uh, Really, any mindfulness meditation does that without music. And the practice is really about using 
your body and your sensations to access what you're calling plain information, which would be to set aside my thoughts, my judgments, expectations, and to just be here for a moment. Yeah. Uh, it's, what, it's, what would you like to know about that? I'd love talking about well, it. Well, I'm not sure. I've never put it. I've, I feel like I've read that word and I've never really dug into it until I saw it, what you share with me in your biography. And so I said, well, I'm going to go read about this. And so it reminded me of other things, I guess, without tacking a name onto it, things that I've read about or practiced in my life. Mm-hmm. And, and I guess it just reminds me very much of mindfulness of being bringing things back to the basics where i try to listen to my breathing and really cycle up with my own body yeah and for me and again i don't know what it is for everybody but for me it's always been um a way to calm my erratic thoughts Mm -hmm. and i say erratic and i don't mean that in uh I guess that word can sound bad, but more just like the way I describe it to my son sometimes, because when he's having a problem, I, I try to tell him things that I've read, which I do believe is his thoughts are like clouds, you know, and the clear blue sky is always there mm-hmm. and the storm's going to pass, but you have to let it, you can hang on to it and try to pull those storm clouds close and like keep them around. And then we just constantly in turmoil. Mm-hmm. And so I guess what I saw whenever I was reading that was that, you know, bringing things back to things as they are, Mm -hmm. not tacking on um, the decorate your door for Christmas theme, basically, is the way I would describe that. Every everything in life, you know, you go to a kid's school and there's all these doors and every season they decorate the door and every door is different. It's very busy. But really behind all that, it's just the door and it's just the classroom. You know, and so I think with thinking, if you're not careful, you can tack on all the decorate your door stuff and make something look like something else. Yeah. But really, when you strip all that stuff off, it's just the door. It's really all the doors are the same. Yeah. And what's interesting is the idea that every door that I've looked at has been a decorated door. And maybe I've yet to even see that (laughs) it's decorated. (laughs) Yeah. and, And that it's a door. Yeah. That's interesting to think about. Yeah, that is interesting. Boston is a wonderful opportunity to experience that. And uh, basically, the process is this you go for 10 days, and it's like a a meditation school for Mm -hmm. 10 days, and it's really an isolated deal. So you got to be silent, can't bring any books to read, um, nothing to write with, no phones. And you're meditating. I think it's. seven or eight hours out of a day for 10 days so that's a lot of time to sit alone with your thoughts right yeah and i can tell you that and it's like unless you go i can't what i want to say is i can't really exaggerate enough how long that is to sit with my own thoughts you know alone with my own thoughts Mm -hmm. it's like wow i've been here for eight hours and i've got Nine days left. Uh, this is going to be difficult. Type Time deal. changes, doesn't it? It's, Does it feel it, like it changes? Yeah, it feels like uh, about a month or something. Pet. It's a long time. But once you get through that, what happens is, or what happened for me is this, which is profound. Okay, It's hard to explain, but I'd like to say that I think everybody has a baseline level of anxiety, like a resting state of yeah. anxiety where i don't know some people are, are, are more highly wound up some people are just relaxed they're born that way they don't really struggle with thoughts and you know it's mm-hmm. a, it's easy yeah i'm not one of those people but i went there with like a baseline anxiety level and when i came out of there that baseline had dropped about in half and it was durable it it hasn't gone back and for me, that was incredible. That's yeah. an incredible gift. And have. you probably want to share it. Totally want to share that. And I've gone twice. Um, I've done transcendental meditation. I've done primordial sound meditation, which is like Deepak Chopra's thing. So I've done all of those. And, and, and Vipassana is the one I would I want to share with people the most. But it's also a big undertaking. You don't want to just 
go try. You want to be ready, like have a look at the reality that you're going to be sitting there for a long time, you know. Well, as I'm listening to you, I mean, that scares a lot of people, what you're right. talking about right there. Because, I mean, in prisons, they use that as a weapon. Yeah, they do. I mean, the, yeah. the solitude. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. You know, it's weaponized. I mean, you know, POW camps, it's weaponized. So leave people alone long enough with their own thoughts and they'll go crazy. They, oh they use that as a torment tool. Sure. And you're getting instruction along the way. Yeah. Well, that's good. Huge so you have part positive. of leaving out. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. That's why. I so, <laughs> someone, so, so you are being trained throughout your 10 days. You're being trained in meditation. You're being told what to expect um, as you're going through it. And your your skills are are being added to with each day. Right? Okay. So you're yeah. getting some instruction, but you can't have a conversation with someone. So you do have that going for you. Um, one of the most incredible things, when you mentioned like solitary confinement, is the experience that I have after 10 days of meditation, and then I'm able to talk to someone. And I got to tell you, it was emotional. Really? To speak to someone. I remember the guy very clearly. He was a total stranger. It was my first one. And I said, we can talk now. And I just went for a hug. And I'm not a hugger. But I just, my body just went out for a hug. And he was like, we can't really hug yet. That's like a rule right now. But we can talk. And it, it meant a lot to me that that kind of connection was so emotional when I spoke to this person like I was overcome with joy and just the understanding that I've got to connect to somebody mm. when I went for the second time I took my best friend Mike Mike Kratchik he came with me and um, that was almost better than me going through it the first time because I got to see him get through it and then come out at the end and then speak to me and so I could see his face, you know. Yeah. And it was just, it was just so cool, man. It's the greatest thing. Well, you know, look, you're making me think about a lot of things hearing you talk about that, and something I really think about a lot. In fact, I, it some, comes up in my life. I was in a conversation with Tom the other day. I was telling him, I said, you know, uh, I wear a Saint Benedict's medal, which a lot of it's very popular in the in Catholic culture to wear that medal. I said, but you know, I'm not sure I'm wearing it for the same reason. I wear it because St. Benedict went into a cave, you know, he left society hmm. because he needed to. A lot of people, we can romanticize what he did and say, well, he left because he was going to, you know, save his faith. But the way he saved his faith was by isolating and getting, going and listening to himself and living in a cave in solitude alone. Nobody was there. And then after a period of time, he did begin to interact with people. And then after he interacted with people, he had a passion for people. Mm. And he came out into the world and, and changed things. And, and it, he brought something new. And so I wear that medal to remind myself that it's very important to have those times of isolation, not isolation in a negative way, but like to really have those quiet times to really let it all kind of melt away. Mm. But it's also just as important to come out of that and go connect with other people. It's of great value to do that to me. It's sort of the ebb and flow of the whole thing. I mean, all mm. the religious figures that I admire have done something similar. I mean, Christ, Buddha, they go to the desert. They go sit at the foot of the tree. They're alone. I mean, they they do the same things. And then when the, the, the next side of that story is always now go and connect with people. Yeah, and that's a really great point. It's one I hadn't really considered. But another thing that I would count under just the how grateful I am that I got to do this meditation experience is like coming out the other end of it because I'm less anxious and a, I don't know whatever it is more mindful sure that takes my ability to listen and connect with other people to a, a level that I didn't have before it How long ago there. was this, Paul? I mean, when did you do this? When was the beginning? Uh, well, I've done two of them. I guess the first one would have been about four years ago, okay. and then the second one would have been about two years ago. So what gets you, I mean, what gets you to that point where you make that 
decision. I, I want to do this. I'm sure. Gonna... What a great question. Um, uh, I'm wondering how long you want the answer to be. I'll take it all. <laughs> I'm, I mean, I, <laughs> I'd i like to think I'm a good listener, and I love good stories, especially these kinds. So I'm, I'm <laughs> well, okay. So it's a good question. I've been attracted to meditation and kind of just inner. I've been an inner looking person for my whole life. Sure. Raised as an only child. You could call me um, an introvert, but I don't think I am. I think I was just an only child. Okay. Not sure. So I'm always looking inward. Playtime is alone time kind of thing. Yeah. I can relate to that. Yeah. So that's how I grow up, and I'm obsessed with the Beatles at a young age. Okay. And it, it matters in this discussion. Okay. Uh, so the Beatles are just the most incredible band ever. Uh, and one of the reasons why is because within their music, when you get to certain albums, you, you then get to certain songs that contain a lot of kind of Eastern spirituality, mm-hmm. a lot of references to meditation, a, you know, wrapped in an amazing musical song. And we already talked about why that's so important. So when you couple those together... For me, that had a huge impact from a very young age. So, so even as like a 10, 11 year old, I'm watching videos of the Beatles on their meditation retreat, and I'm going, yeah. "Wow, that just looks cool." Yeah. For, for me, for so whatever it's, reason, it's adding more and more layers to your right. Yeah. Okay. So that seed is planted. Then, um, as I get older, uh, I start getting into my own therapy my own counseling stuff in about 2007 self work is inner work for yourself is myself okay yeah, i'm not working on becoming a professional counselor gotcha. but i am doing my personal work that needs to be done the hard work yeah right mm. and so that is the beginning of um, me actually starting a meditation endeavor and i started with dr wayne dyer yeah he has some um he had this like our father that was kind of co-opted into a sound meditation and outward sounds like an uh kind of yeah. thing you know yeah there's that stuff so did that wonderful did it for like a year loved it moved on from there to primordial sound meditation which is deepak chopra has a a program you can do at the time it was in lafayette there was a teacher there so i went there and did that from there, I do transcendental meditation, which is mantra-based meditation. So that is, you get your own personal, you know, mantra, yeah. and you you sort of focus on it internally, all right? And that's the person that the Beatles studied with, the Maharishi. Yeah. Right? So I thought, oh, this is so cool. Um, from there, how did I get to Vipassana? I've got a really good friend who is into this sort of thing. And he introduced me to Vipassana about seven years before I did it. Okay. And there's a great documentary out there about um, Dharma boys or something like that, where they take Vipassana and they put it in the prison system. Oh, wow. Okay. And so they offer it to some inmates and you kind of see that. That's awesome. That's a documentary? Documentary. I have to check that out. Okay. And there's a really good documentary on YouTube as well about vipassana so i watched those got really excited by then i already had a a pretty solid meditation background i wasn't afraid of you know sitting for 10 days yeah you've already kind of been wading into this your whole life really i was afraid but i thought it's a good afraid like a like you know i want to do it yeah it's like a vision quest kind of Kind of like to a that. degree. I mean, yeah. it sounds like the way people approach that. It's like it's terrifying, but I'm going to do this. Come out the other side. Something exactly. new is going to be exactly. And it is, you know, it's not easy to sit there with your thoughts. You are left with nothing. Your fears will come out very quickly, and you, you can do nothing but sit sit with them. But when you do that long enough, there's a magic that happens, and you you're able to get this kind of objective position. And you're really able to see your thoughts yeah. coming and going. And also, it's it's a big part of that practice is about the physical. Okay? So imagine that you sit on a pillow with no chair back. 
Sure. For eight hours. Yeah. Right? That's hard to do if you don't do it every day just for an hour. Absolutely. I mean, if you're not used to that, that I mean, I know I do some meditation, not 10 hours, but I mean, when I do, it can be very uncomfortable sometimes. Yeah. You start to become hyper aware of all the little things Absolutely. in your body that aren't. So that's what the, a big part of this practice is about is like, you're going to feel physical pain. And so you also get the opportunity to notice this physical pain. This comes and goes. And it will not last. And so you're sitting there long enough to really experience the pain coming and going and your own thoughts coming and going. And all the while, you're just here and you can observe it all. And so you just get a perspective that uh, I find to be really, really uh, helpful. It's yeah. Great. It's great stuff. So that's the that's the... The quick version of me getting into Vipassana meditation. And I'm happy, I know it. You've probably heard me mention filming videos, building websites, creating logos, or building brands on this podcast. Well, there's a good reason for that. I'm a brand builder, and my brand is Parker Brand Creative Services. My team and I have built countless brands in the Gulf Coast region, and a lot of our work in the travel and tourism industry is experienced across the country, and honestly, the whole world. We have our specialties, web, logo, package, and whole brand design, as well as video production and photography. But the reality is we function as a full service advertising agency to businesses that don't really mesh well with larger advertising agencies or just don't want to have in-house creative departments. But don't listen to what I say. Just go to our website, parkerbrandup.com and take a look at what we do. We're a show it, don't say it team. Okay, you should definitely say it too, but you know what I mean. That's parkerbrandup.com. We think sideways, we push forward, and we'll get your brand up. So take this, you've earned it, a melody in chorus. And so draw a line, if you, I mean, just so I understand. So is your path to becoming a counselor from that, is, was that a part of that? I mean, would you say that that was a, or were you always on that path, you felt like, but this was uh, just a part of it? Hmm. Or did that sort of, be, was that like, hey, you know, this, this practice has um, helped me. And also, you're doing all this inner work. Do you think, hey, this can be of value to other people? I want to help other people. Mm. Is that really the motivator, or is it... So, the motivator to to become, to yeah. become a counselor? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so th- that's all a part of it, each other, absolutely. But the biggest thing about me becoming a counselor is I had a counselor who saved my life. Gotcha. And this man, his name is Rick Prophet. I don't yeah. mind uh, saying his name. Yeah. He... He saved my life, and, and, and that, that's a dramatic way of putting it, but it's, it's more appropriate to say he showed me that life could be something that I had not considered it could be, and it took about five years. I mean, it's not like I did one session and he, you know. Yeah. Right. So he did that, okay? Yeah. And I've had two other counselors who really, really you know, altered the course of my life for the better. Yeah. I'm so grateful to them. And so that's the story. He does that. I loved being in counseling. Always loved it. Just think it's the greatest thing. So I do that for long enough, um, and eventually I get to a place where I think, this is something I would do. You know, if I, I, I distinctly thought at one point, if I didn't have to worry about money at all, which it's a great way to, you know, just try to think about what you want to do. Yeah. A lot of people do that. Yeah. Then I would go to counseling, go to group, I would go to the gym, and I would play tennis and music. Those are the, that's what I came up with. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. So I, I thought, well, I can do that, you know. I yeah. might be able to be a counselor. So I went and um, I asked a few people. Um, whose opinion I valued. Do you think I could do this? You know, and they were like, "Yeah, you know, go for it." And um, and then I did it. And that's that's that story. So really, it's just being inspired by another counselor, really enjoying the process of group self awareness. Looking inward has always been something I've done, and I just love it. It's like a value for me. Yeah. And so that's a, it's a good profession to be in if you have that kind of um 
drive, I think. Yeah. For me, it is. I like it. You know, that inner work is, God, I say it all the time because it's the most important work. It's the most frightening work as well. Mm-hmm. I mean, the things that I find inside myself, mm-hmm. and I'm sure you've had similar things, circumstances or, or experiences. And when I... It, it sometimes it takes years Mm -hmm. and it's like you find something inside yourself and you're like, man, this is really a thing. This is really, it lives, it breathes. It's, it's taken up, uh, it's made a home inside. It's myself inside of me. This thing lives here. Right. Or whatever that I'm calling it a thing. But I mean, I I described it to somebody the other day. I said, it's, it's hung pictures on the wall. You know, it's got, (laughs) I love that. You know, it's got a home in there. It's, (laughs) and it's not just like a little temporary shelter. (laughs) Yeah. This is not a metaphor. There's an actual, (laughs) there's a, there's something there. Yeah. And those pictures are of things that have give it life and identity. And, um, every once in a while, something in the outside world will send me for a visit to that house. Yes. You know, and that's something you said a second ago, and I thought about it because it's something I have to tell myself all the time is awareness doesn't always make a difference. Because sometimes we think just because we're aware of something that, oh, well, I now have this awareness of this. It's going to good. That's all I need is the awareness. Mm -mm. Years and years and years of work later. Yeah, I'm glad I'm aware, but I'm still having to do the work because some of those things just, like I said, build homes and they pour down slabs and then they even build other things around. It's like a little encampment, Mm -hmm. you know, and um, I used to believe you could root that stuff out and I'm, and maybe you can, but I don't know if there's enough life in a lifetime to completely root it out. But I think we're just admitting that the work needs to always be done. Vigilance, I think is the word that I've, come to believe is the best term for me is being vigilant Hmm. of those things that live in there and knowing what out here Hmm. stimulates them sure and knowing that i can't avoid them because they they're everywhere but at the same time um sort of just building up new muscle memory i guess internal muscle memory of how to wrestle with those things i guess really and that's really and that Sometimes that isn't even so peaceful. No. You know, like that's actually, there's this, I don't know, I guess I'm talking around it. Like for me and my people, uh, my bloodline that I come from tend to be quite hot tempered. Mm -hmm. And so I've always struggled with that. It's like similar to you. That was always a thing for me as a child. I was very early realized that I didn't like hot tempered people. Mm Mm-hmm. And I think some of that comes from just having a hot-tempered parent and maybe some hot-tempered grandparents on, on a certain side of my family. So, But when you're a kid, you don't know that's what it is. What's this aversion? Where is right. it coming from? But as I got older and I found those hot tempers inside myself, that terrified me hmm. even more because then I've got this sort of aversion to it outside of myself, but now I see it inside of me sure. too. So I'm it's, resisting that. Yeah. I'm going, well, now I've got it from both places. And um, the times that I've take the nasty plunge, you know, and let it be itself, it's never been a good thing. So I don't know. Just wrestling with it has always been important to me. Mm. And it's actually given me some peace. But but there are times when that out of all the things, it's the biggest thing that I have to wrestle with. It's the one thing that I go, it's worth it. It's worth it because it's just all gasoline and fire. Yeah. Do you know? And that's yeah. not good. Inner work is hard work, and you, you know, the thing the thing that strikes me about working on myself and inner work is the fact that it doesn't have to be done. Sure. There's a lot of people who aren't going to do it. <laughs> right. I was going to want to get to some sort of a version of this subject. So, yes, that's right. To do it is is to have some kind of audacious way about you and say i want more i'm not willing to go back to where i was um i'm gonna do whatever it takes to get what this person is telling me can exist because if you're looking for new interstates if you're looking for a new life that means you've never experienced it so you have to take it on faith that what this counselor this friend this other person that their life is something i can get if i want it yeah and that is real yeah that is a stretch, and that is, uh, I think, a big barrier that holds a lot of 
people and at one time held me from pursuing my own inner work. Yeah. Because there's a hopelessness in there that I can't solve my inner work. Yeah. I can't root up the foundation in this lifetime. Yeah. I'm here to say, absolutely you can. Absolutely you can. I've done it. Counselors are out there. Your pastor's out there. There are people all around you who will get you to where you want to be, and you can get through this stuff and just root it out and have this life. Yeah. Take it. But I know that even as I say that, if anyone's listening to this, there's going to be some who are going to go, this guy's a Pollyanna. Yeah, yeah right, 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 right. And that goes against being a Pollyanna. It kind of almost goes against what the type of meditation you're talking about is basically saying. It's like, no, I'm not a Pollyanna. Life is what it is. Mm. Without anything tacked on, there's good, there's bad, or a lot of what we think is good and bad is just our perception of that. Mm -hmm. Uh, And you're not saying that. That's not what you're saying, that life is all, you know, daisies and buttercups. Mm. No, no. This this particular meditation actually rests on a principle that all of life is pain. That's its number one principle in the sense of that's where you start from. And if you accept that, (laughs) you've got great places to go. See, I want to talk about this. Okay. This particularly. Yeah. Because it's I I, I avoid talking about it a lot because it's not well received mm-hmm. um always. Because when I I, I practice something I, I made this up, so just get ready. Cool. Uh <laughs> well, let's hear I just it. call it the three ribbons. I I've talked about it off at the end of a podcast the other night with a good friend of mine because we were talking about religion and things like that and I said I've always struggled because I've found over the last 24 years of my life I've kind of meandered into a couple of strong pillars for me I find a lot of my worldview comes from Christian mysticism and I'm and I'm get to that that sounds very isolated okay. but I'm going to get somewhere with that and then the other thing the way I've the other big pillar for me has been Buddhist teaching and that's another broad pillar but I won't say that I dive into one particular tradition within either one of those camps because there's a third that's that's the two ribbons mm-hmm. but there's a third ribbon for me uh, the way my mind is organized this is the red ribbon is my Christian okay. mysticism the yellow ribbon is my the way I practice Buddhism the third ribbon is nothing. It's no color. It's mystery. I don't even know what it looks like because between those two pillars, I have to leave room for mystery mm. because there's so much that we don't know. And that's the space where I can read like the Upanishads and I hear the same words I hear in the Christian mysticism or the Buddhist scriptures, mm-hmm. or I can read the Quran or whatever. And I, that's the mystery spot, mm-hmm. the bleed over. Or the things that I just don't know that I can't explain, and I'm at the, and to be okay with the mystery ribbon, you know. And then this morning, as I was kind of meditating on that, I thought, you know, the mystery ribbon. Sometimes it, I tend to end up forming it and start to see what it looks like. And when I feel that happening, I have to almost like crash it and go, no, this isn't what this ribbon is. This ribbon always needs to be on the wind, so to speak, yeah. you know. And uh, I say all that to to kind of get into suffering Mm -hmm. because for me those two traditions deal with suffering in a very beautiful way Mm -hmm. and trans the transformation of suffering that life is suffering sounds terrible doesn't it it does to some people they hear oh life's suffering but i don't hear it the same way Mm -hmm. i see it as like the ground of that the ground almost that um this suffering (laughs) is i don't know in a duality with the joy that comes out the other side of it and i really don't feel like in my life i can have i can't have one without the other i had need and have needed all the pains to experience all the joys i that's maybe not everybody's made up that way but i don't know it's for me that's what i've experienced is Mm -hmm. i and it's given me hope i guess the other side of brokenness is something else there's something in it um my wife loves i can't think of the name of the japanese practice of taking a broken bowl and repairing it with gold Mm -hmm. uh, or a cup or whatever and i love that because that's exactly i guess what i feel about suffering very deeply is that when it happens there is a smashing and a threshing and it feels like pain 
but there is a gold to be found in the mending, mm -hmm. so to speak. And that's the tragedy, I think, is when people suffer, sometimes we don't mend properly. We don't see the joy from the suffering. And so then we get broken and we stay broken mm -hmm. and sort of just callous around the crack. Is that, that's a lot to throw out there. I mean, I don't know if that. Um, yeah, that's a lot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Blam. It is a lot. I mean, pain and suffering is it? Oh, it's something to talk about, isn't it? Yeah. One of the things when I was listening to your show, uh, I listened to your show with Rosie. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, and she, you had some discussion about giving pain meaning. That's yeah. what it was. Giving a value to your pain. Yeah. That's an existential psychotherapy thing. Okay. That's a Viktor Frankl thing. Have you ever read any Viktor mm -mm. Frankl, Man's Search for Meaning? Mm -mm, no. Great stuff. Viktor Frankl is a psychologist who was in the concentration camps, and he wrote a book about oh, it. And okay. What he found was the people in the concentration camps who were able to find meaning, purpose, things to do in there, essentially survived. Mm-hmm. That's a reductive take on what he wrote, but it's... I'm, yeah, I'm but I get what you're you. saying, so, sure. So if anybody's out there wanting to criticize, please do. <laughs> but um, that's his whole thing. And so if you can find a value in your pain, that is the task of life. Because you don't get through life without hurting. You don't love people without getting your heart broken. That's a part of it. That is it. They exist together. Without one, there isn't the other one. We're getting philosophical, but no, I, there I, it is. Yeah, that to experience the pain is to also experience the joy. Yeah, of life. It can be transformative for me. I mean, I, it's again, it kind of like what you said to anybody listening. Someone can go, well, that you just haven't had my pain. That's right. You haven't. Done, <laughs> well, you're, it's easy to say unless you've had my pain. Uh -huh. And honestly, uh, without revealing too much, I mean, that happened to me recently. In a conversation with someone that I have come to care for pretty deeply, um, they didn't really know me. And what I was discovering as we started getting to know each other was there was an assumption mm. from the other person that I didn't understand their pain. Mm. And I started to think about it, put that back on myself. I was like, how many times have I done this where in my life where I thought, you just don't understand my pain. You don't know what I'm going through. You can, no, no words are consoling. Because there's an assumption that the other person doesn't get it. Mm -hmm. In this particular situation, knowing what the person's suffering from, I was like, actually, shockingly, sort of the Lego block to your pain. Because I do actually, I've been through all these things, and they're painful. Right. But I'm always wary of, of pain fish stories. What does that mean? You know, my fish is bigger than your fish. Oh, sure. I caught a five pound. I caught a six pound. Mine I've was hurt more big. than you have. Yeah, I've hurt more than you had. So I've had to, and there's an impulse to go. Oh no, I understand. So so let's let's cons let me console. Let's us console each other because I've suffered too. And it was strange, and I, I had to resisted that impulse, and I'm glad I did because ultimately those things come out naturally over the course of time. Mm -hmm. um, it's strange. Yeah. Because what we're talking this practice we're talking about, if if we're talking about Buddhism, is really what's exciting about that for me is this. It's about being happy. That's nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's designed to make you happy. Mm hmm That's what it's for. It's not really designed for anything else. And for me it's a psychological practice. It's a practice of the mechanics of your thinking mind and mm -hmm. nothing more nothing more yeah super Plain. practical on this earth yeah right it can be done by this person this person you, absolutely yeah, right follow the instructions we will show yeah. you how to be happy right for me that's like okay i'm in i'm doing this it's a prescription right yeah because i'm of a particular type of person who's wanted to be happy from a young age which carries the presumption that he wasn't happy then. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> of course, right? Yeah. So I'm all in for that sort of thing. And it does that. So for me, that's enough to say if this practice says, first you got to accept that there's going to be a lot of pain. Right. That's number one on your way to becoming 
what actual happiness would be, which is wonderful. It's wonderful. It's a wonderful like antithesis to this Pollyanna idea of happiness because that doesn't exist. That, that this type of real happiness accepts pain first. There will be pain. Yeah. That's reality. Okay. So the, the word happiness in this discussion is, is a, a deeper type of happiness as opposed to I'm walking around floating on a cloud. Everything's wonderful and everything's awesome here. Yeah. In that's per- and honestly, I would call that a, it's almost like a false happiness. It's a totally it's pretend. Yeah, I'll call it misery. Really. Yeah. I mean, I have somebody who I know in my life very well um, that feigns happiness mm. And, it, and, and I've always sensed it. Like, it's a feigned happiness, and there's, a, there's almost words associated with it. We're blessed. It's all good. Mm. At the end of very negative things, and I'm like, this is a tacked-on happiness. Do you know what I mean? It's yes. like, it's just like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to put it at the end of everything I say. Sure. And, it's, it, and it makes me sad, to be honest with you, because I go, that's not reality. You're really wrapped in the bulk of the statement, which is the pain. Mm. Mm-hmm. And you want to be happy is what I hear. Yeah. Well, I, I, when I sense that t- type of happiness, I imagine it like a small happiness band-aid over this world of pain that I can sense, but I'm not being let into. Sure. It's like this fishbowl right here. If you found out then when you pulled the stickers off that that was all that was holding it together. Yeah. It's a fishbowl <laughs> we're looking at and it's covered in stickers and you can't really see the glass because it's covered in stickers. Yeah. So you're saying it's like... If we took these off and figured out nothing's holding it up but the stickers. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it is like that. Yeah. I mean, I, um, I've i always had, I, and this is something from a young age, I don't know where this comes from, but for me, uh, I used to, I've always said it this way. It's the best way to say it because it's the way I understand it is I, I tend to uh, carry other people's pain. I don't know where that comes from, but I remember doing it at a young, young age. And I, I don't know if I've ever told the story, but I, I'd love to get your take on this. And I wonder where these things come from sometimes. And honestly, I think it's why I've leaned towards certain philosophies uh, because of who I was as a child. Just listening to you, I mean, obviously, the, who you are as a child, it, it plays into who you are as an adult so much. And I think we forget. Sometimes we just take, and that that was childhood. and. Mm close that book and then there's another one but i don't look at my own life that way there's no way for me to do it i sometimes am still the same kid in this story i'm about to tell you Mm -hmm. my grandmother had a neighbor who um got national geographic when i was a kid and that's one of the ways i learned to read was having those boxes and boxes it was really cool i still have some of them one particular i still have actually the one i'm about to mention but um anyway I, i learned about the world i just even if i couldn't read everything the pictures i was just it was a big eye opener i mean eight years old seven years old and you're seeing things that you just have never been exposed to oh yeah they had the maps i just used to love them one time particularly the issue was about africa and it was called i think famine or tragedy in the horn of africa i think and it was of a woman and her child on the cover, and they were bones. Hmm. And I was little. I mean, I was probably my youngest son's age. I think I was eight or nine. And that one hit me like a ton of bricks, man. I mean... You remember that? Oh, I remember it because I... I sound so strange for a child to do, but I went in my grandmother's bathroom, and I shut the little... <laughs> shut the door. I turned the water on. And I cried, Mm -hmm. and I cried, and I cried, and I looked at those pictures, every page, and I just, like, hid with my hand over my mouth, just wailing, crying for these people. Now, that's a moment, right? Mm -hmm. And you'd think that moment's going to pass, but I hung on to it, and I hung on to that book, and I wanted to do it again. And it wasn't like out of a a sick sadism. I wanted to feel for those people through that National Geographic, and I did it a lot more. I've never, I don't, I've never told my mother, nobody. I mean, I've told my wife this story. I said, but that moment for me flipped a switch inside of me, and after that, I couldn't not see other people's pain 
Hmm. Like it was almost like a weird acuteness to it. And it just developed over time. And I found that I lived for many years in a sad, it wasn't like a depression. Maybe it is. I don't know. Maybe it was. I don't know. But I, it was like I lived in the peripherals of other people's pain. Like uh, maybe that's not the right way to say it. Keep going. I would see people hurting, mm-hmm. whatever it may be, an argument, um, a child that just looked a little too not uh, unkept, a, an animal on the side of the road that didn't look like it had a place to live. Wow. And I, my mind would, and my heart would all get thrown into that mm-hmm. to where I couldn't even be present with whatever I was doing. Like it would just my, and even if I wouldn't do anything to change the situation, some part of me just got wrapped up in that. And so, uh, it became very important to me to not forget those things. So I found that in my memory, those are the things I remember the most are moments of tragedy or some not like tragedy, like nine 11. That's a tragedy, but I'm talking about like the small minutia of pain. Wow. And I have a collection of those, um, inside myself. I love that. And I, I ended up for years later, when I was probably 22 or 23 years old, it was when I was watching the movie Kundun. And at the end of that movie, I didn't know it then what I was hearing, but they were reciting um, the, from the way of the Bodhisattva from Santa Diva. And I cried. I cried listening to those words. And I was like, what is that mm-hmm. right there that I just heard? Because it, it How was old like were you then? about 22. Mm, 22. I was married and I had already been kind of trying to understand some things in my life and Buddhism was kind of in my life. But that particularly, and I was like, I need to know what that is, where it came from, what is that? And then I started reading about the Bodhisattva and the ideal of it and the suffering and not in a negative way. Like I would tell people about that and they were like, it sounds so negative. I'm like, no, no, it's beautiful. It's hard to understand. This being wants to doesn't can't let go can't go on to nirvana if a single being in this universe is suffering hmm. and devotes theirself to it now i'm not saying i've done that right but the ideal of it satiated the despair i guess hmm. does that mean any of that that a lot uh, of that makes sense to me what what it sounds to me like is when you're eight years old, you see the you see the bones, right? Yeah, I have that right so far. Yeah, yeah, just starving bones, people. Yeah, that's that is some stark reality to behold as an eight year old. Where'd you grow up? Here, Sulphur. Here in Sulphur, Louisiana. That's a dose of reality. That I mean, maybe now if you're watching the news as an eight year old, but to look at some bones and really take it in and behold it. And to imagine that there are people who are born into a place unlike sulfur, where they starve to death and become a pile of bones, yeah, is a heavy load to take in if you actually take it in and don't decide to make fun of it or do whatever. Because that did happen in our world. Other kids did. Happening all the time. Yeah, sure. It still happens. Yeah. Right now, as we're having this conversation. Yeah. But for you, what kind of blossomed in that moment when I listened to your story is this deep empathy for other people's suffering. If I'm and being that, honest, Paul, it's hard for me. You can probably... Yeah, I see it. I, it's hard. I'm holding back the way I feel even thinking about right. that moment. So, it's very hard. What we're doing is understanding the beauty of the suffering. That when you see that and your empathy is awoken, that through that pain, now you are able to love. Now you're able to have a place for that. You see? Yeah. You don't get that without seeing the bones as an eight. You don't get it. And you don't get every other thing that you care for in your life moving forward. I have a really firm belief in that. So that's, for me, where the joy comes through this suffering. And that if you can transform that suffering, which is happening everywhere... (laughs) Yeah. right now right if you can't transform that that's a problem that's a life problem for me you know that's not yeah. something i'm willing to well i wouldn't trade it mm-hmm. 
I know that. I, 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 as an older, now becoming an older man, <laughs> I uh, I think now sometimes I do. I've had these sort of almost whimsical, like in jest, I'll say sometimes I'm like, why can't I just leave? Why can't I just not worry about that? Oh, sure. I do that all the time. I go, why, why, <laughs> why can't I just not? Because I do look around the world sometimes as a, uh, I take on a role. And I mean, maybe a lot of people do this. I'm sure you have before. We all do when you're learning to observe your own thoughts you can't help but observe the world in a different way too and you sit outside and you start to observe the things going on almost detached from it a little bit and mm-hmm. just become an, an i don't know just an observer yeah just standing in the midst of it all and uh as i do the thought that thoughts will arise and fall away and and some of those thoughts will be like this is a bad thing and it needs to change you know and the suffering over here and I guess uh, now what I've learned is I just let myself. I don't fight it anymore. I let myself fall into the tears. Mm. I cry. I wail. I let the pain come in. And then when it's time for it to end, it ends. Sure. And then I just remind myself that if an opportunity arises to alleviate someone's suffering, whatever capacity that is, then I'll just do it. Mm. And that's brought me a lot of peace with that because it doesn't stop. And it's not going to, and I don't know that I want it to. I don't, on one hand, like I said, in jest, I'll go, why can't I just let that alone? Why do I have to worry about that? Nobody else is worrying about that. Nobody else is sitting there thinking about this. And I say that again, nobody, that's a broad generalization, but yeah, I mean, those are, um, it's hard when you, here's what's hard about what we're talking about. Okay. So let's take your example. I'm an eight year old. I see some bones. I have what, what? I would call this existential crisis. This sure. This is an existential crisis. Sure, right? yeah. An eight-year-old looking at bones across the... That is some hard And nobody stuff. knows it's going on, just all isolated. Yeah, it's yeah. just like... Alone with a magazine. <laughs> yeah. I mean, wow. People sometimes think an eight-year-old isn't a human being or something, but right. they, you know, kids understand, and they're hit emotionally with this. This is huge. Huge. So you have that right there. Where was I going? I totally forgot. Do you remember? Well, we were just talking about the formation of this as an adult. I oh, was saying how. Here's what here's what is troubling. Okay, so you have that existential dilemma, the crisis. Yeah. Right? It's tough if you get stuck there and you can't help but let your thoughts go to only the pain. Yeah. And if I'm driving down the road and I see an animal that's wounded, all of my thoughts are now with that animal for the rest of the day and maybe a week. Yeah. That's a problem. Yeah. Okay. I've been there. <laughs> that's hard. Me too. Yeah. A mindfulness practice can help that because you just, that's anxiety. That's what you call anxiety. My thoughts are going places that, that I don't want them to go and it makes it very uncomfortable for me. I start to worry about my future in a very real way, but mindfulness can help that. So it's like, a, for me, it's a blessing and a curse to have this kind of empathy, to have this mind that does want to think about these problems and can't Mm -hmm. just ignore these problems some people have a very easy time with that there's nothing right or wrong about it yeah um but some some people don't don't really have to worry about that too much well honestly paul this us sitting here in this whole show show whatever that is i mean it really is a manifestation it comes directly from that moment in that bathroom because i as even to this day i still can if without the inner work and without the struggle i can slide down that hole i can slide into that cave and not come out or i could yeah and so watching myself as i've gotten older i go okay the frequency and the 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 feeling of boy it would be nice to just step into that cave and just stay there when that starts to when that started to occur more frequently for me my whole outlook on the world begins to shift and then just like you said my mind becomes consumed with right and then i feel like i'm cheating strangely enough and i don't know where that comes from either but like then i feel like well but if i don't think about these things that's not right it's unjust these people somebody you know we have to think about it right so my morality gets tied up in there and so for me this show manifests out of that it's like hey okay so i have to remind myself there's good hearts out there. There's good people out there doing small work, large work, whatever. I need that so I don't 
I need that because that, then we can build a little fire outside the cave. Mm. Does it make? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, you better engage in something that gives you uh, hope and light. Yeah, because if you don't, you you can be overtaken. Well, and it's just like you said, you know, you you become a counselor because other people counseled you. Sure. Now you that's the, that's the reason I became it. But to be very clear, I do it because I I think it's fun. I love it. Really? Yeah. I really. So you find joy in that? Yeah. Oh, big joy, big time. Love it. And I want it. I heard something in your talk that I want to challenge a little bit. Okay. With you and Rosie, it was like you had this idea. One of you did. And the idea went essentially like this, and it's one I'm so familiar with. It's like, if I heal my pain, does that take away my ability to help someone else with their mm, pain? Yeah. Can I no longer relate if it's healed? Yeah, and it relates yeah, we did a lot talk to, about that. to music and artists in particular. I think artists have this idea that if I'm not damaged, I can't make art. Gotcha. Yeah. And I, I, this is a non cuss word show, but I don't believe that at all anymore. You know, I don't believe that at all. You can cuss on this show. I'm going to choose not to. <laughs> I'm so proud of myself. You I'm did good, man. <laughs> but look, I don't like that idea. And, and frankly... That you have to have the wound and the pain and absolutely. it has to stay there And you got to hold out. on to it. You got to hold on to yeah, it. Yeah, treasure it almost. Because it's the thing that gives me my art. Mm, I see, I reject I see. that completely. I reject that completely. You can I, let it go. You can heal it and it'll I be think fine. It, I think that it kills artists, that idea. Mm. I think that hurts people and keeps them stuck forever. And the most brilliant, beautiful artists heal that stuff through their art. And then they move forward. So what I wanted to challenge about what you all talked about was that idea that I need my pain to see it in someone else and to help them heal mm, it. You I don't see. need that at all. And in fact, if you've moved through it, what does that mean? It doesn't mean it's gone at all. It just means you've gone to a, a higher perspective or a different place. It's still there and you will always have the eight-year-old looking at bones yeah he will always be there right yeah you don't need that eight-year-old wrecking your life to relate to another eight-year-old who's in pain in fact i would argue that would keep you from helping that eight-year-old and the best thing you could do is is live your life to its fullest because that pain it it will not go it will not go and the only way it's not going to serve you is if you stay stuck in it for the rest of your life because you can't see out of it if you're in there yeah well it sounds like what you're describing as you're talking i'm getting this picture in my head of uh like this uh now i'm gonna say a cuss word like a (laughs) like a fucked up teddy bear oh i like that you know it's like this teddy bear that you've got and then uh you kind of purposely maybe poke pull the eye off and then sew something else where the eye used to be and then you pull the stitches open you start stuffing pulling out this nice stuff and stuffing it with all this junk sat you just stitch it all up and before long it stinks and you're carrying it around you know and you're loving and snuggling with it all the time right i need it In yeah fact, I, need I need it it's my little teddy bear and i need to show it to you too yeah look at this yeah it's funny another thing that pops in my head and it's related to art too is i'm sure you're familiar with the picture that's all over catholic culture the sacred heart of jesus mm. And one of the things, a meditation I had on that one time was that it, it relates to what you're saying, I guess, in that you look at, I look at that and I said, you know, it is, it's wounded. I mean, it is bleeding. There's a wound in it and there's blood coming out of it. It's got thorns wrapped around it and there's blood coming out of that too. But what's it doing? Hmm. It's burning and it's glowing. So when I would look at that, I said, it's we can get wrapped up in the wound and the thorns and just stay right there but you got to get to the glowing and burning part Mm. because if you just stay in the wound part so i guess it kind of relates to what you're saying i mean just that image alone is sort of the cycle of that that we really kind of need to it's hard to get past the thorns right and the blood and i imagine the stuff i just said might kind of minimize someone's pain i don't want to do that no i don't think so it's just it's i think you're identifying that staying stuck there we don't need basically just in a nutshell simply we don't need to stay stuck there we've got to move past it to that that brighter point exactly and then to really say to really challenge and say yeah like you said earlier just because you're aware of it 
doesn't mean anything at all. It's great. It's like I, you know, it's like if I were to look at you and we're friends, and I go, you know, I know I'm a really bad friend. Yeah, and then just stay right there. Exactly. Yeah, I'm so, a bad so, friend, and I'm going to stay like, a bad friend. It's like now that you know that, what are you going to do about it? Is what really counts. Yeah, and you don't need to stay in it. Then mm-hmm. you don't need to stay in it, and you can get out. Yeah, you're you're talking my language, man, because that's that's the wheel, mm-hmm. right? I mean, that's the merry-go-round that we can get stuck on, and it goes and has a long revolution sometimes, and we don't even realize. We're, for me, I know there's things where I go, I didn't even know this was a cycle. Mm-hmm. I did something when I'm ten that I don't really do again till I'm twenty. I didn't, th- and I, then it happens again when I'm. 30 and then 40 when you've got a decade between revolutions it's harder to sense that this is a cycle we don't live long enough to see the cycle right at least this lifetime and whatever your belief is you may not see it Mm -hmm. and it takes then when you do though if you, you live long enough and you're like 50 60 70 then you're going i've done this six times that doesn't sound like a lot but that wheel of fortune comes around sooner or later and it's in you sure the pattern of the thing and it's like stuck you don't even know you're stuck it's so seductive it's like or deceptive deceptive and that merry-go-round carries through generations all right yeah the great grandfathers who came before us same merry-go-round and one of the most amazing things about the counseling process for me is to imagine Mm -hmm. that there are generations before me who had to deal with stuff yeah. and the opportunity that it could stop with me right yeah that my kids their kids whoever comes after that that dysfunction if that's what we want to call sure. it can stop at this table and how many generations before has this been going on and been tra- because if you look at dysfunction abuse the stuff carries from generation to generation right yeah but at any moment, a person can engage their inner work and stop that. That, to me, is just the most beautiful thing. I agree. You can stop that, you know? It is. It is beautiful, isn't it? I mean, I, I can relate that to my own family very easily because, um, you know, as a young man, I had a lot of anger against my father because of the way he was and the way he dealt with things, the way he dealt with me. It so it causes me to want to do the inner work later in life because i don't want to do that i don't want to be that and not to say i'm better by any stretch and the reason i say that there was a time when i thought well i'm going to be better than him i'm going to have more emotional intelligence and a bigger heart and blah 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 Mm -hmm. you know so on with the fictions i tell myself that i'm going to do all this stuff Then as I get older and then he passes away and I start to really meditate because of pain, the pain cracked open things that I couldn't see. Mm -hmm. So pain cracks this open. I start to see things in a new way. Then I get to see my father a little differently and I go, wait a second. This is the wheel we just talked about. He was, I find out he wasn't treated Mm -hmm. properly Mm -hmm. way worse than I thought I was treated. Mm went through way worse but it's the same things getting handed off he was whether i knew it or not and whether he even knew it or not he was attempting to whatever capacity he could to break the chain himself better and he did do better yeah i know it now but i didn't know it then and now i have that i call it you know just an obligation and maybe some people would say we're not obligated to do anything but i i feel an obligation to say okay I've got to do better, too. I want to make those cycles longer or get rid of them or just stop certain things, take certain things off the merry-go-round so they don't get passed on. Yeah. But that does. It takes work. But, you have, like you said, you, you, have to, you have to see it and want to do that work. Yeah. I mean, you have to engage yourself in that process. And, you know, walking into a counseling office – is a is a difficult thing to do. I I love it. It's my place now. But I rem, you know I can remember the first time and I, I see people mm. walking in, and just the room and the idea just provokes anxiety in people. Yeah, it's like oh I'm here to. It's like oh you can. It's almost like sometimes things just 
they're so ready to come out. And, yeah. You know, it's like they, the place can kind of provoke that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and a lot of people um, might think, I don't want to do that. It's scary. Um, yeah, it's a challenge. It's definitely hard work. You're, you're right on the money. You've said that multiple times. It's like, it's hard work. Definitely. Well, it's digging a hole, man. I mean, I, I, I compare it to excavation. I mean... Mm-hmm really when you don't know what you're i mean if you go pick a spot anywhere mm-hmm. and start digging straight into the ground <laughs> and you're going to find something at three feet and then five feet and then 10 feet and who knows what you're going to hit eventually you're going to hit something maybe nasty real nasty down there that just excites me that doesn't excite you, you no know, it does excite yeah. me yeah and that's I've, I've been to counseling and i think and i mean again i, I say this on the show i will grow 10 arms to pat myself on the back but I don't mean it to sound this way, but I think I respond well to it. You must. You're doing this show right now. This show is a form of it and yeah. t- to some degree. And I think even like what you said, I can. I was relating it to that. I've had people come in here who have said, I'm very nervous to sit down and mm. do this. After 30 or 40 minutes, it's like, oh, I don't know what I was nervous about. But it's um, it's fearful to just sit and talk. Sure. And just want to intentionally just, and we're not counseling. Well, kind of to some degree, but I mean, but you know, we're not, but we're, we're not. But we are connecting. <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah, we're being honest, and we're trying, and we're revealing and sharing, and that's difficult, even at this level. I find for for a lot of folks, and I don't know. I'm not sure. Not so sure. I fully understand why. For me, it's like the duality of like I love. I've said this before on here. I love people, but I'm afraid of people. Mm-hmm. And I just think we maybe are afraid of what's going to happen if we show a soft, tender spot, because then the rib cage is off and the it's out there. It's like out there to be hurt. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I felt that coming coming here. Really, my concern with coming here and doing this isn't you and I. Yeah. But the vulnerability of I'm in a podcast yeah, people are going to listen to this. And here's the beauty of being in a relationship, of being in counseling and doing some kind of inner work with someone. I extend myself to you. Now you have the ability to chop my hand off. Yeah. And that's vulnerability. Yeah. And that's what I'm doing. So that's that's the concern, I think, always. And at any new, any relationship, it's growing and there's always a new vulnerability coming around the corner. <laughs> yeah it's just can i trust you yeah with that you know yeah not to hurt me too bad yeah i think that that's for things to change in this world to, to become better whatever that even that means to, to to begin to see less suffering and to see more love and more compassion and more mercy towards each other i think we have to do that we have to learn to that we can extend and that we're that <laughs> i always have this visual of like holding my heart out mm-hmm. to somebody and then like you know you've seen these movies where someone like stabs something incredibly fast 50 times oh, and then runs wow. off it's like stab, stab 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 and then runs away that's what i think a lot of people feel like with vulnerability it's like here's my heart man and it's like oh cool and then stab 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 and then they're off it's like, what the hell just happened? That sounds terrible. It does sound terrible. And I think maybe that's a lot more of that going on. We have more ways mm. and more knives now mm-hmm. um, and more anonymity, too. Mm. Yeah. You know, so there's not a um, and then and reasons to not connect. I mean, the Internet is a I love the Internet, but it's a huge culprit. I mean, you don't see the person's eye in the eyes. It's much harder for me to stab your heart. Oh, eye to eye. Sitting yeah. here on with at this table. Yeah. Then it would be if I didn't know you and you're on the internet. I mean, you're a lovely man. Hey, thanks a lot. Really, a lovely human being. And but if I don't take the time to get to know you or care enough to just extend a invitation to you, I see you on the internet. Someone could just come stab you in the heart real quick, mm-hmm. and like you have to live with whatever they said and whatever they did, and they have no eye-to-eye connection with you no reason to care yeah it's becoming like an impulse out there i think just a man need. that's um i've been lucky to record some music yeah and that's the most for me the most frightening part of putting out music is the commenting or the, the well, reception really the or? vulnerability oh okay and i wouldn't have known it before i put put songs out you know but what it's really like is 
well, kind of writing like a diary. Sure. And then asking people to read it. Yeah. That's a, st- that's yeah. a strange thing to do. Um, yeah, I bet. Scary. Super fun, though. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a... You know? Hmm. Music's interesting. It's funny because I wouldn't say I'm like a connoisseur of music, and I don't even know what that even means, but I love music, but I couldn't tell you what type of music I love. My son laughs because he's like, your music tastes are all over the place. I said, well, I just like a lot of stuff, man. I mean, I don't have like a one thing, I'm, and I mean, I love listening to 50s music, but I also love listening to bluegrass, and sometimes I like listening to you know Daft Punk, and it's just whatever. The way I respond to music is, does it make me feel a certain way? It's usually about feeling. Yeah. Does it make me feel a certain way? And if it makes me feel something like, oh, I want to remember that, I'll just, that's what I listen to. That's cool. And so I think that's with writing too, because that's where I more, I can relate to what you're saying is like putting a thought out there Mm -hmm. that is, could be challenged or disagreed with, um, it's frightening. It's terrifying to step out there. The best example for me right now is Rosie. Oh, yeah. The stuff Rosie writes and puts out there is like, wow. She's right. It's incredible. To be that um, exposed. Open. Yep. That's a rare thing. Rare thing. I think it is. I think most of the time it's tailored. People, We do get tailored content from most most folks. Mm -hmm. Rosie's doing something definitely different and special in that regard. People are responding, too. You know, I mean, you see, I see that people are going, oh, I, I understand. I think the special thing about Rosie for me is the feeling of the, the first thing that's the most important for me, I guess, is going not alone. Those two words, not alone. Mm. And I think so many people, that's just the first thing they need to know. They may not have. They may not go to the next level of resolving the problem, but just step one, not alone, yeah. because some people are alone inside their own skull. Totally, and that that'll take them. I mean, look, I'll tell you, I have a, a child who's been who suffered with that, mm-hmm. and I watched. She has to do the hard work. I'll say that. I mean, I'm impressed by her. I don't know who all is, but I every day go. She's. She's got a struggle and she's doing the work Mm. and it's hard. And I watched year by year her mind become her worst enemy and and like try to take her. Certainly can. I mean, it's it's, it's difficult. It is. And I think, um, I don't know, now, you know, going to group and therapy and counseling and things like that, it's that not alone. That's that was step one. You're not alone. She might not phrase it that way, but I'm, that's what I'm seeing as an outsider looking in. I'm like, where the response is best is when she says, oh, there's another person who's like me. Mm-hmm. Oh, th- I'm not special. I'm not isolated. There is hope. It, it's the beginning. It's huge. You know, have you experienced that in counseling where like people respond well when they go, when they, whenever you tell somebody well, you know, this is this. This is what you're just describing. Well, you've done it to me today. You said, well, what that sounds like is is this particular thing, and mm-hmm. there is a way out of this. Absolutely. I mean, naming a problem is very helpful for a lot of people, I think. Um, I'm fortunate to be able to run some counseling groups yeah. in my job, and that's always a huge part of the feedback I get from new group members is... is having my fellow group members is so valuable and you're absolutely right it, you're so right that it's like I forget about it because I'm in I'm in counseling land which is like somewhere else far down the road but it always st- starts with a friendly face and one that is going through what I'm going through mm-hmm. we're going through it together and I'm not alone absolutely so huge you know Not to get all religious, but it was something I had. It reminds me of it. Uh, Being, you know, those the three ribbons, as I told you, sometimes I get a little bit of flack for that because, you know, you get sort of like in one camp doesn't. It's like, well, you can't be in two camps in Mm. another camp. 
such a strange place to live. It's yeah. it's a weird sort of nebulous territory. But on the Christian side of that, I heard something. I was watching a documentary called Father of Lights, and the at the beginning of the documentary, what was interesting was um, the guy said something that stuck with me, and he said the history of the world's religions, mostly, especially the ones that are dealing with God, uh, particularly, is God man seeking God. In Christianity, it's God seeking man, hmm. and I loved that. Because it was, it, it kind of touched on that exactly. It was like, I'm here to tell you, you're not alone. Mm-hmm. And which just immediately for me, I mean, it brought tears to my eyes because I was like, that touches me in a certain particular way to go, you're not alone. Mm-hmm. What is it about being alone? And, and I can imagine people who are maybe afraid of meditation, especially like 10 day retreats and things like that, where they fear that because they f- maybe the, the, the fear of being alone. Oh my gosh. And it, there is a sense of utter loneliness and isolation that comes on day five in particular. There's a there's a there's a there's a set of without giving it away in case anyone goes. There's a difficult day in there and a, and a difficult stretch of time, and that sense of loneliness is deep, deep. Yeah, so I relate to that very much. Yeah, and is that what it feels like? Like just I'm alone. Does it, I mean, it maybe. It's maybe not even a thought. It might just be a feeling that you can recall. Was it just like, I'm alone, I'm alone, alone? I, did, I don't remember feeling lonely, but there's it's, it's, there's like a stark kind of isolation. Um, and what, what happened for me is you find a place. I found a place within mm. where... Where it was okay. Yeah. I don't know what else to say about it, really. You don't have any other choice. If you're going to stay... Yeah, there's nowhere to escape. That's exactly right. That's the beauty of it. There's you, there's no escape. Unless you decide to get up and walk away, which people you, did, and people do. They don't make it sometimes. Yeah. The 10, days. 10 days is a long time. And it's that way for a reason, but you're absolutely right. There's no escape. And so if you're forced to sit with it long enough, the people are asking you to do that for a reason because they know something you yet know. <laughs> and so if you sit through it, you get that. And the the isolation or the loneliness turns into something else. It turns into, I guess I would call it peace. Yeah. Don't know what other word to use. And strength, I guess. Something happens in there and it, it, it was really really cool and and if if i were to name it peace and kind of related to what you're saying it would be that yeah that that i am very isolated at this moment but so is everyone else they might be hiding from it right now maybe they've not encountered a higher power or something like that sure but this is a deeply human experience that i've come face to face with and can no longer distract myself from and that's a wonderful gift and a difficult one to arrive at that that has got to be a, a something that you can draw on out in the real world because I mean it has to be applicable. And I say the real world, I don't mean that to sound the way it does, but like uh, examples would be like um, traffic, a uh, grocery store line. Do you find yourself just going? I'm just going to settle into myself and just ride this out. Yeah, yeah, All right. It, yeah, because what what happens in a in a meditation retreat of any kind, or in traffic, or in the grocery store. The thing that's worse than the thing you're going through is my resistance to the thing I'm going through. Yeah. And yeah. So, so Vipassana <laughs> is an exercise in shutting down the voices that say, I can't stand this. This is terrible. Yes. And if you can sidestep that commentary, <laughs> you can do anything. Period. End of sentence. Yeah. Anything. And, and, and to say that is one thing, but to have an experiential knowledge of that resistance and that voice falling away is something else altogether and you got to experience it to have the experiential knowledge um and i'm so grateful for that see it comes for me in the grocery store but i don't think about it like i'm saying my baseline human anxiety level just got cut in half so sort of like six months after that that retreat i'm like i look back on the six months post retreat i'm going wow this life is a lot easier now than it used to be. 
I'm not as stressed out as I used to be. Yeah. And it's it's has stuck with me. It's durable. Yeah. Which is a thing that is hard to find in modern durable. medicine. Durable. I like that. In counseling. In life, it's hard to find a durable benefit, a durable behavior change, a durable change in perspective. And, and I would, you know, at the risk of whatever, I would say permanent. I haven't gone back. I went in there with a particular concern. I was, this was years ago, so I was worried about, I was worried about a girl that I was interested in. And the first day, I was dominated, dominated by thoughts about this person and the situation. Wow, I've been there. I know what you mean. Like, you're in, just it's consuming, right? Consuming. But by day three, uh, I'm on to different concerns. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And six months after the retreat, it's like I have a hard time remembering now being in that state. Yeah. Hard to... (laughs) I've never been on a retreat like that, but I do understand, I believe, what you're talking about. Because I've, I try to practice to whatever feeble attempt it is. I, I try to practice things similar to what you're describing out in the world. And I have been places for shorter periods of time where purposely to go and just be quiet. Yeah. And, and I always, the first step for me is watching what's go, just watching my head dispassionately. Like it's a movie almost. Like it's a, someone changing the channels. That's the only way I can describe it. Like just a bunch of noise. Yeah. And it is strange what takes over and who I become focused on or problems that are just like, man, they are there. And I guess I do understand what you mean too. Now, for me, I don't typically have enough time to get into the place where all the thoughts have sort of settled but I do know what you mean, that first wave. It's like an, it's funny because it does remind me of Buddha's story, you know, Mara's attacks. Tell me. Uh, so Mara, Buddha sits under the tree to try to attain enlightenment. You know, basically he's, he's went through all the extreme things that he's done. You know, he was e- extreme asceticism. I mean, fasting on a grain of rice a day. I mean, you know, just really doing all this crazy stuff. I say crazy stuff because it was very bad for his body and then finally finding this middle path where he's like i'm i found the middle way it's between the extremes Mm -hmm. so he sits beneath the tree but as the story goes that mara you know the deceiver the tempter does not want this being to see the truth because he knows he's on the precipice you know so he be he starts attacking him for these days and the onslaughts get worse and worse he attacks him with women he attacks him with you know lavish things he attacks him with all these things all the the seven deadly sins so to speak and each time buddha faces whatever mara's attack is and he transmutes it basically into something else mm. and it cools down and that doesn't work and it reminds me of what we're talking about i guess is in a in an ancient way and in a very poetic and beautiful way that's what they're describing Mm -hmm. is that he's attacked by his own demons so to speak Mm -hmm. in his own mind throwing these onslaughts at him don't look here don't don't be calm don't have peace yeah and then as the days go by they cool and they just you know enters into that state yeah it's all their whole it's all about attraction and aversion with a vipassana practice and it Really simple things like they'll just tell you your mind can only go in two directions, out into the future or back into the past. Attraction for stuff that I want or aversion for things that I don't want. Okay? And so if you can let go of those, you can be perfectly at peace in the present moment. But to let go of those is incredibly difficult. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Human brain has evolved to look out for danger and to sustain survival been doing it for as long as brains have been around there's nothing wrong with it it's survival but it can cause a lot of pain yeah Mm -hmm. great practice yeah i mean it sounds like something i would like to do and then also just uh really just to begin to apply some of those principles and begin to apply them in day-to-day life oh yeah oh you got to do it if you want to do it you got to do it that's what i like to say Something I thought I had earlier too. I, I tend to like I like to 
find common ground between other between things. It's that mystery ribbon I was talking mm-hmm. about. But you were talking about earlier in counseling um, when you name something, mm-hmm. it, you begin to you're on the path then to um, healing it perhaps or solving it because once it's been named you know there's a way out it made me think of sometimes we call our mind demons with demons in our mind and it kind of makes me think of uh, the, the exorcism practice that's one of the practices is knowing the demon's name mm-hmm. once you have the demon's name in that practice then you that's the be the you have to get that to exercise it you you don't have power over it until you know its name well that's one of the things these priests exorcists look for is that demon's name Hmm. and i find that's interesting that even in counseling there's sort of to some degree we have to name we have to find out what this is we need to find the root name it understand it because once we can do that then we can begin to exercise Mm. it to some degree yeah it's naming a particular whatever it may be is helpful it's not something i spend a large amount of time doing but normalizing the experience of a human mind and knowing that i'm not the only one yeah who has experienced this who's overcome this who's been in this place before huge so huge gotta have that yeah you know so i want to make a full circle here Mm -hmm. going back to music what's what we started out and you know when you came in here we not whenever i contact you it was about music and even the begin i think it's pretty fascinating the way our conversation meandered we started about music Mm -hmm. and we entered into the mind you know Mm. it's kind of a beautiful thing yeah we're great (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> i hope people think so <laughs> well at least we do there's two of us um how does music now you know i mean you've always been involved with it mm-hmm. but you've changed mm-hmm. okay and when you mentioned that earlier how music can be uh, different for you at different points in your life and have new meaning the same song looking at yourself as a child the whole string of your life, the Beatles, the types of music you've played and been involved with, and now where you're at today. How has that changed for you, and how has music evolved for you now? How do you see music versus the way you maybe first experienced it when you were a child? Gosh. That's probably a huge... Huge question. What a huge, wonderful question. So how has music for me changed from when I was a child to now. Yeah, well, I asked that question how I relate really to it. more complicated. <laughs> how, I, how I relate to it, what it means to yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, how's that shifted for you, or maybe evolved, maybe is the right way to... Evolved, okay. Music starts for me um, with... I love I love sounds, and I love music, and I have a great grandfather, Tommy Gosselin, who played with Gene Krupa. There's some music in my blood, famous jazz musician. I got you. Uh, So there's that. There's also a story about my mother being pregnant with me and going to the movies to see The Big Chill. Have you ever seen The Big Chill? Yeah, I have. Uh huh. Tons of great music in there. And her story is, at the movie, there was something wrong with the audio and it was like insanely loud. And she just couldn't take it and it was like this horrible experience for her. But for me, that kind of, I, I just think... I had this romantic idea that like I could hear the rock and roll through the womb. You yeah, know, right. A lot and it's just me. getting it's infusing into it, yeah the fluid and yeah right. Yeah, right. I like to think that. But my dad was into music big time. My dad was super into Tom Petty, and I have this like huge Tom Petty phase, and I love Tom Petty. So there's that. Right? Mm-hmm. So I pick it up, pick up a guitar. Great, it was fun. It starts out as fun. And then at some point it turns into, I want to be a rock star. Yeah. Right? (laughs) I want to be famous. Which is a dangerous, dangerous desire and question and thing to set out for. Right? Yeah. Dangerous. Um, So that's where it goes. It takes me into college. I go to school at LSU. I play in high school with a bunch of friends that I still get to play with, but we we go to LSU and we start the flamethrowers. Oh, yeah, okay. We play cover songs and we get a we get a good deal out of it. We get to play 
on you know LSU campus after a football game, and there's like people just love it. It's great. We get to in the summertime. We go to Panama City, and they give us a place to stay. Oh and man, we play yeah. rock and roll, and it's that fun, fun, right? So there's all of that, and there's there's a dark turn in that era for me, and it it takes me into counseling. It takes me into my path. And I'm very grateful for that. But the desire to be a famous musician, at some point, right around then, after my time at LSU, after my time with the Flamethrowers, it, it, the realization of life, the stark reality that we speak of before, sinks in. I'm either not good enough to be a professional musician, I've yet to define that in a way that's doable for someone like me, or I have this idea that I'm going to be as famous as Elvis. Which is never going to happen again. Gotcha. So it's like too big. All of these kind of dreams that really don't serve to make me happy in any kind of way. That kind of morphs and and becomes a different question. It becomes, why did I want to do this at all in the first place? I mean, if you you ask a person like me then, what is it that makes you want to be this famous musician? Like, what is it? What is really going on there? What would that do for you? Because flamethrowers now play for 3,000 people. They make plenty of money to have a living. and They're professional musicians. Like, they could be if they yeah. wanted to. What's the difference between that and being, like, a Jonas brother or something or whatever? Yeah. There's a difference, but, it, you know, you got to ask, yeah. what's the real difference there? Music, at some point, went from that kind of endeavor for me to... To what it is now, and this is recent. This has only happened in the past year. Um, I spent a lot of time playing solo music to make cash, and yeah, that's 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 very not fun for me and kind of unfulfilling. Recently, it's become a way to relate to people, which is what it started out as. It's fun. We're having a good time. We're playing together. We're making meaningful music together. It's really, really fun. Really innocent. It's the way it starts out. That's the way I feel about it now, which I'm so grateful for. I can't tell you how grateful I am that I'm in love with music again. It is amazing. That's wonderful. It can It's man. only come back like a year ago. Like if you would ask my close friends about Paul's relationship with music in the last five years, they'd be like, he just told me like a year and a half ago that he hated music and he was never going to play again. Wow. And that would have been true. But currently, right now, I just am so happy to have people to play with, to play songs and to write with them and sing with them and play guitar. And it's just really, really fun. It's a way to connect emotionally. And now counseling meditation spirituality religion it's all the same stuff i'm just connecting with people that i care about in meaningful ways and the act of playing a guitar for some kind of magical reason acts like the music box that you have at the cemetery where it can really take people away sure and out of whatever they came in the door with And I can play a guitar, and maybe for 10 seconds, you're going to forget about whatever was going on. And, like, that is some meaningful stuff. Oh, it is. That's that's beautiful, man. That's absolutely beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. That, there's nothing more to add to that, man. I mean, what you just said is exactly it, just for that moment. Hearing you say that, it makes me think of Teenager in Love. Just Mm. that one song particularly always brings me back to that time in my life and all the things that were wrapped up in it and yeah you don't you don't know unless i tell you that story you don't know that's what's happening in me you're playing teenager in love and you're loving that you're doing it and you have this sense that it's somebody's music box out there Mm. and i'm telling you here in front of you that it in that moment it is my music box and it has that time period attached to it how many more stories could people tell right. you like that for any number of times you do that? That's awesome, dude. Great effect. And to think about music from that perspective yeah. is a much different perspective than I'm up here trying to get famous and get rich. Yeah. Come on. 
those are not even the same uh, world. No, man. You know? You're literally... I mean, it, I mean that's just the way it affects me, but the way it could affect anybody. I mean, you're flipping switches in people's Which inner... is another thing about the 50s music that I absolutely love. Flipping switches. If you talk about Elvis, if you look into the story of Elvis, <laughs> come on. Elvis flipped everyone's switch and broke people free of their constricted lives. I mean, he broke people free. In a dangerous way. Like, people feared Elvis. People who control yeah. people fear Elvis. Like they did. Yeah. Because he broke the youth free. Yeah, what's happening with this guy Elvis? What's going on with it's the kids? It's a big, yeah. big, big deal. And the deeper I look into this music, the more strongly I believe in it. And I just really, really oh, it's so deep, man. It's like I love hearing that because I've never thought about it this way. I know that and, particular because I love it too, and I didn't know, I never thought about it that oh way. God. That it was that there was something else going on there. Oh man, Elvis takes the hillbilly culture, the blues, the rock and roll. He creates rock and roll and unites cultures, and and just I mean, he blows away barriers. It's incredible. Incredible story. That is incredible. It's incredible to think about it. That I don't way. know enough to speak intelligently about it, but I, I know I'm super excited about it. And um, it's such a cool lineage to kind of carry out it musically. It's yeah. fun. It's super fun. That's pretty awesome, man. I mean, I, I guess it really opens my mind to it, and it makes me think about why... It makes me feel the way it makes me feel now. Yeah, if you stop and think about it, it gets kind of weird. Yeah. And, you know, that's... I don't know what y'all's time... Do y'all have, like, a time frame that you kind of say, well, we're going to play in this zone, and this is the, right. these are the bookmarks for this? Yeah. So that's that's a difficult part of us, and we're, we're actively working that out. And I think where we've recently come to land is we're going to do... We're going to do sort of early 50s through 1965 oh perfect and that's, that's awesome <laughs> that, that, that will give us a lot i was initially i was very rigid about it just being from the 50s but if you're talking about 50s doo-wop and, and rock and roll that's actually a short amount of time yeah like five to seven years so if we stretch out to 65 then we have the ability to do um, more fun stuff well yeah you get into like a little bit different sound too. I mean, you get like Blue Bayou and right, just stuff that just go okay. This is a it's still in that time period, but the music begins to shift. Yeah, yeah, huh? That's interesting. Mm-hmm. I uh, is there? I wanted to ask you this a minute ago. Is there a particular song that you like to play though? Out of that, that what you played so far? Is there one that you just go? This is the one for me that just oh sure. What is it? There's a song that we play called life is but a dream and it's a doo-wop song you know it's obscure i know it you know it oh yeah how beautiful is that uh let's see as only life could be a dream that's what i'm thinking of of life is but a dream uh it's what you make it oh nope i don't know that okay i was thinking a different song it is just the most beautiful I, i gotta be honest with you i don't know why i connect to this music so hard maybe it's my time of my life or something but i connect to this song so deeply i who, mean when i sing it i get emotional who saying who was who is the artist i would have to look okay life is but a dream yeah yeah i'll have to put it's a link obscure, to it in this uh, when we post. group it's no one overly famous okay it is i think i found it on like a soundtrack of a movie or something um but it's just so beautifully states creating a life. It's, it's like life is but a dream. It's what you make it. We can build a love, um, none to compare with. Sort of, It has a lot of responsibility in it, which yeah. is a big deal for me. Like, this is your life. Do the work. Make it. But you can make it. Yeah. You can make it happen, you know. So it's, it's kind of got this responsibility to it, but it's just beautiful. And we have... Um, we have three singers in our band. Emmy Lawson, a beautiful, beautiful girlfriend. I love her. She's amazing. Joe Norman sings. Uh, so we can do three-part harmonies. Oh, that's great. And they just, 
to, to also Mark Robertson in the band Henry Johnson. I want to say that they're amazing too. Your son is a musician. Well, no, he's um he's in the band. band. He does color so, guard. So so he'll relate to this. But but when you're a musician and you get to stand inside of a song uh, as it is exploding all around you. Uh huh. Imagine that. Yeah. Imagine listening to your favorite song, right? Yeah. Now imagine you could stand on stage while that band is playing mm. that song, and so then you're in it. That's interesting, yeah. Um, it takes it to a whole other level. That's interesting and to think of to that And then to imagine being the one who is delivering the song to people who want to hear it instead of just being the one listening. Because then you're standing in the song, you're hearing it, and you're delivering it to someone else. That's some powerful stuff. Man, you're talking about something. It's, it's kind of like reading Walden, hmm. you know, by Thoreau, the way he describes sitting out on the lake in the cabin. What you just described about being in the song is exactly what he's describing out being in the woods. Hmm. It's not the same anymore. Something's different. It's not the same as um, that's over there. Oh, yeah, You know, like that's very much how we experience life is like, hello, flower, I see you over there. I'm a man. But when you get to cross the bridge mm-hmm. and you begin to see uh, one of my he's up on the shelf, think not Han. I'm sure you may mm-hmm. have read mm-hmm. when he talks about interbeing. It's just always so drippy and beautiful. And I love it because I'm like he begins to that the uh, separation begins to disappear Dissolve. between you yeah. and the other and. I love that, and that's what you, I'm listening to you, and I'm going, man, that's you're getting into that place where you kind of sounds like you dissolve to some degree oh, yeah. and just sort of become the music. Sure, that's beautiful. And we're getting we're getting out there philosophically, so we're we're getting vulnerable. But <laughs> but yeah, if I'm gonna get philosophical about music, yeah, you dissolve, you become the song. Yeah, that's it. So what's wonderful about playing music and playing guitar when it works right is my brain is offline. It's gone. I'm not in the building, and I'm able to play. And you can really, really just just kind of check out, just transcend yeah. thoughts. That's like it's kind of transcendental meditation in itself exactly. right there. I mean, Now, if you're playing guitar and your brain gets in the way, that's when you can't play guitar anymore in front of people. <laughs> and I see not, what you mean. It's difficult. Yeah. 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 You get in the way of all the things, the, the, the things that have been built in now sure. that are happening. What you, yeah. You're looking for that kind of intuitive yeah. self to take over. Sort which, of the Tao of the whole thing. It's like, sure. this is just happening. This is all the ebb and flow. One of the greatest at that, that I have access to is Mickey Smith Jr., Oh, I get to play yeah. with him with a Chris Sherman experience. I've played with him a few times. Yeah, I've seen y'all. I, you know, I've never seen y'all live, but I've seen videos. Wonderful stuff. He can just, boom, he's there. That's awesome. Yeah. I love He's Mickey. just, boom, he's transcended. You know? Yeah. It's like, it. what happens in that type of band is you get a nod, and then you start your solo. So it's coming fast. You don't know it's coming. Ah, oh, okay. So it'd be like, Chris is singing, Chris is singing. If you're Mickey, it'd be like, boom, solo. And you, you, Mickey, would know, okay, I got a solo now. And so to drop in that moment super hard and just, you know, yeah. enter the stratosphere of m- musical Mickey Smith Jr. awesomeness happens in a split second. And he just goes there and stays there, and it's incredible. It is so Isn't cool that to something? watch. Is what awesome. is that? I mean, you got to be a really, uh, you got to be a, um, he could probably tell you better than me, but you got to be able to step out of your thinking brain. You got to be able to step out of it and enter that zone. He is so good at that, man. It's so cool to watch. I yeah. think that's why people respond to him even more than just notes coming out of a saxophone. Yeah, I think you can pick up on that just talking to him. That well, a person settling into who they are. Yeah, is sort of similar. Exactly. You know, when you start to, and it takes a lifetime sometimes to do that. To but, but even some people very young, you see them, they've sort of, in, if they're an instrument, they've settled into it, and they just yeah. sort of they're out there in the world. And you go, and I see, I've always, I don't know that that's happened for me because I look out and I go, I can see that with other people. I go, huh, 
all the pieces look like it's sort of working together effort, effortlessly. Now, now that's not always the case, but it's perceived that way. Mm-hmm. And so for me, when I reflect, I wonder sometimes, I go, so, hmm, do I have par- parts of my life where I am that way and then other parts that I'm not and how come they're so scattered? Mm. And I do have parts, and it's strange. I, when I was listening to you describe that, I was going, "What? where do I have anything in my life like that? And I brought this up on the show, too, but it's odd. It's in a crisis. Hmm. When there's a crisis, and I mean like an emergency, maybe not like a life or death one, but something where it's like it has to happen now, mm-hmm. and oh, yeah. someone needs you, and it could be – I may not even know what it is, but I got to go. Somehow, my mind gets like – glass clear tranquil tranquil yeah my anxieties go away and i don't know if it's because i have a pointedness now something to latch on to so everything gets like thrown into that but it's like there i, I know what to do oh, i know like what to that. do things yeah. are okay and and my wife it's we, we kind of i said it's kind of a, <laughs> a weird superpower because it's good but it's only good then and the thing that you don't ever want to have happen yeah you know so it's not like it's good day to day <laughs> but if you get in a jam, no who to call. I'm okay. I mean, I don't know why, and it's been like that for years. And everyone would say that that knows me really close. I go, yeah, it just seems to sort of everything calms down, and it's when you ought to be freaking out. And I do. I tend to look around and go, everyone's panicking. Why are they panicking? Because hmm. I'm just getting. I don't know if my body's dumping something, chemicals or something's going on in there, and I don't know where that came from. That's but really cool. It's a very strange I thing. Wonder. I don't know. Nothing. I try to think, did something happen? I can't put my finger on it. But I guess we're all just, there's stuff we know and stuff we don't. <laughs> stuff to be revealed. Stuff to be revealed. Yeah, stuff to be revealed. Yeah. Um. So we have this thing on the show. You know about the fishbowl? What is the fish? Is it a question? Yeah. Yeah. Everybody. So that, that's got some questions that mm-hmm. I kind of seeded it with. Okay. And then everybody who's been on the show and then also guests of I mean, listeners of the show email me questions that mm-hmm. they just, they're, they're for anybody. Mm-hmm. So what I ask is that you draw three questions and uh-huh. then I'll read them to you and then we'll okay. just discuss <laughs> where they go. <laughs> Would you like me to do it now? Yeah, go ahead. Just pull three of them out and then. Uh, okay. This and is then exciting. I'll read them to you. They're mysteries, like fortune cookies, I guess. I've got three. All right. Let's see what happens here. And you know what's crazy is there's like, I want to say 150 questions or so in there, and it's growing weekly. But uh, oddly enough, everybody keeps pulling. Everybody's at least pulled the same question once. Okay. It's kind of crazy. Mm, this is interesting. So I'm going to read them real quick to myself. Okay. <laughs> it happened. All right. So we'll start with the first one. Uh, what is one thing that you would never like to be associated with? Oh, wow. Huh. That's that's actually not very hard for me to answer. One thing I would like to never be associated with, um, the thing that I want to be associated with, if I'm going yeah, to no. change your question. Go for it. <laughs> is inner freedom. Mm. Inner freedom self-awareness are my biggest biggest values and it hasn't always been that way so i know that people who know me well are are gonna think maybe this is bs coming out of me but it isn't so the thing that i'd like to not be never be associated with is constriction inner constriction keeping someone locked up in something that isn't serving them Mm. that just that that gets me fired up. I have warm feelings that are approaching anger when I think about people being constricted by other people or ideas that are keeping them from deep inner freedom. Yeah, I can relate to that. I get a, I don't know if I'd word it exactly like that, but it's in the same territory for me. I feel a deep, deep sense of justice, and I don't know any mm. word to use for it, but I feel unjust injustice very much when i see other people being um discriminated against or cast out that's always been a problem it bothers me deeply Mm. so i can relate to that i loved what you said with um tony tony bork oh tony yeah it was like uh you let me sit at this table if you see this outer part of me you see see what i look like Mm. or something like that yeah but if you saw what i was thinking 
or what I believed, you wouldn't let me see. Sure. I, you don't want to know what that's about. I, I can tell that. you. I'll tell you where that comes from. And it's hurtful for me to talk about, and I haven't really talked about it on the show, but in, in the spirit of being transparent, I ask everybody to be transparent, so I'll be transparent. Um, I have some pretty deep mystical beliefs. I mean, I say yeah. beliefs, but then they don't come from just what I've read. They come from things that have happened in my life that I can't quite put my finger on, but that I've tried to understand. And in trying to understand them, I've read a lot of books. I mean, that's not saying, oh, well, was, look, Oren's read a lot of books. Way to go, Oren. But it's I'm trying to understand what, because it's a mystery. When something mystical happens to you, I'll say mystical, I don't know, supernatural, whatever, something that you can't quite frame in science or anything else, and it occurs more than once. I want to understand that. And so in the in the seeking of understanding, I find there's a whole world <laughs> out yeah. there that I can be framed in so many different ways. Over the course of my life, I found things that, for me, explain this better than others. Right? I'm getting around to the point. No, I'm with you. So the point being, I landed in Christianity as a silo for a lot of that, but only some of it. Mm -hmm. I hit barriers there that just still can't quite put my finger on mm -hmm. but what i've experienced is other people want to explain it for me when i hit those barriers and say well you need to stop here because there's a barrier just like you're saying and i'm going well yeah but that doesn't stop here as is some a statement i've experienced before and a statement in if you tell me to stop here in regard to my own yeah philosophical spiritual exploration i don't respond kindly see to me either and that's what i've kind of experienced but and, and other things for me has been that when i hit that wall with my fellow man mm -hmm. it doesn't take too much searching for me to find somewhere in history another being who hit that wall and said well i'm gonna go for thanks but no thanks and they went on and found what i'm looking for and it's usually somebody within the same silo mm -hmm. They're just not being recognized. They are, they're just uh, above us. We've elevated them to the saint status. Mm. When I go read the lives of the saints and things like that, I am blown away at what I find. Mm. That just is bonkers. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, just straight up bonkers that, yeah, that somebody really. would go, that's crazy. And I'm like, yeah, but we've elevated them now. We're saying these people have experienced this, and then, but we don't. Yeah, That doesn't make any sense to me. I can't compute that, that it can't be, can't happen again, that this thing that sounds totally bonkers and would be a great science fiction movie is we've said has happened. We all agree it. We've gave them the badge of honor, but it doesn't happen now. Hmm. It can't happen today. That always really just the wall for me was, and then the way you're treated when you begin to get in that territory you're no longer welcome at the table because you're no longer speaking the language that's acceptable mm -hmm. that we've all agreed on within the culture of this. Oh my gosh! And that kind of stuff just eats we can at go me. Go on for days down that road. <laughs> yeah. I love going down those roads. The show will have to end at some point sooner or later. So yeah, that's kind of that. I'm with you. I will say all that to say that I do. You respond to that that idea that like constriction stop growing stop seeking is something i never want to be associated yeah. with yeah the only time that i would even that i'm ever for the constriction is when it begins to harm another being mm -hmm. really and you're starting to see well your rights have you've taken your rights of your right to freedom into their property sure, or so, land, yeah you know? so let me be double clear that what i'm talking about is inner psychological freedom yeah. and not anything to do with someone's outer freedom but just the freedom from my inner critic the mm, freedom from my yeah. cravings and my aversion the freedom from the psychological things that keep me stuck in pain that's it i love that yeah freedom from psychological things that keep me stuck in pain yeah write that down folks mm. <laughs> <laughs> hmm that's your next question okay number two what is something constant in your life? I guess the way that's framed, I would say something that you know you can depend on that's going to be there. Mm. Jeez. Mm, I know. So, something I know, can you say it again? What 
is something constant in your life. So this kind of turned into a, a, a podcast episode about Vipassana. Yeah. I didn't think it would, but it is. Uh, to answer this question, I would say another thing that is huge in Vipassana in, for me is an idea of, they say this word, Anicca. Anicca, Anicca. You hear this all the time. Ten An- days. Anicca? Anicca, Anicca. What this means is that everything's passing. Everything's changing. All of the time. All of the time. Everything comes and goes constantly. Right? Yeah. This, they're just drilling this into you. So, that is a freeing experience for me. And when I try to hold on to the things that I love, it doesn't work out for me very well. Mm-hmm. But when I understand that they're all passing, they're all going to go. That's a sad truth, but it also grounds me very deeply in the present moment. And I want to be very close with the people that I do have right now, mm. that I love and care about. All right. So to be philosophical to this question and say everything's get, everything's gonna go I know mm. that I have a deep firm belief in that and I rest in that I find empowerment there but if I'm gonna be a little more down to earth with it I would say my mother my mom is absolutely there 100% single mom 100% there for me just non-stop the stuff that she's done for me and I don't know you know there's no way to um, repay that or really even do it a lot of justice other than to say yeah. I'm really grateful that she's there because I have experience working with people who don't have that and it's easy to take for granted mm. so I think that's my answer that's a beautiful answer Brother, I got to tell you that that both of those things touch me in a special way. <laughs> On my computer monitor, I have the words taped uh, changes the law. I've mm-hmm. kind of carried it from job to job, but it wasn't about the job, but it was always to remember that everything that comes together dissolves. Mm. And that sounds I've said that to many people in my life and they that sounds very negative to most of the folks that I've presented it to. But hearing you say it, it's mm-hmm. nice to actually sit across the table from somebody who really sees that as a beautiful thing. It's the way to love things, truly, is it to really understand is. that they pass. It really away. is. And it's it, all things must pass is a wonderful thing. But a lot of people for some reason assume that that applies to things that I want to pass Mm. and for me it applies more to the things that I don't want to pass they too are gonna pass yeah and that brings you hyper into the present and you know I think about that when I lay every one of my children you know as they've gotten older that's that is exactly what's happening when I lay in their bed with them and I'm rubbing their hair and they're falling asleep I think, and I've watched, you know, two of them grow past that stage where they want me to lay in the bed. And I, I now I know with my, my third child, now I go, this will pass away. This moment will not be here. You will become, you will get to a point in your life where this, you don't want this anymore. Isn't it strange how that can sound negative to someone? Yeah, but the beauty, the hypersensitivity of everything happening in just a simple bedroom with a child the way they smell, the way they breathe, all of that gets heightened, just like your music. being It's right. like you're inside of that moment, and it comes from an awareness that it's passing. That it's passing, and you don't get it without that awareness. No. And what you get instead is taking your life for granted. Yes. And it passing you so by beautiful. without ever being involved in it. And that's so beautiful. Yeah. And I, too, on the other thing, was that I, too, have a constant mother who's really suffered a lot in her life and and experienced a lot of tragedy and yet still has always i know right now my mother is in no position to take care of anybody she really has a hard time taking care of herself honestly and yet constant if if i were in a situation where i needed my mother i know she would find it within herself to help to whatever capacity 
Mm. I asked and, and probably beyond. And, you know, sometimes when I, I told a while back, something happened and I, I told somebody, I said, I, I don't know if I can say the words, I'm, but I'm getting emotional. When I look for the face of compassion, it looks like my mother. Mm-hmm. That's the truth. And that's some serious gratitude right there. Yeah. Yeah. She may not fully know. <laughs> no, she there's no way for me to explain what the internal feeling is and understanding of that. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I relate to both of those things deeply. Yeah. I'm glad you what a good question. shared those. Yeah, it was a good question. I don't know, and I don't know who sent some of these in, but that was a good one. Yeah. Number three. Wow. Number three. Oh. I wonder if it's going to be that emotional. I don't know. This one's interesting because <laughs> okay. I, I could probably spend a whole two hours talking about myself on this one. What are you hypocritical about? Mm. What am I hypocritical? So hypocritical is like, I say I don't like that thing, but I actually do it. Yeah, or like you say, like it would, I'm just totally making this up, but you go, you should meditate. <laughs> and then you're like, never meditate. Do you know what I mean? Or like, oh should gosh. eat better and then all you do is eat hamburgers or, I don't know, you, you see. <laughs> um, yeah, you should eat better, but I always eat hamburgers. Okay. So what am I hypocritical about? Yeah. This is confession time almost. This. Yeah. Yeah. What am I hypocritical about? Jeez. Hmm. I mean, it's pretty... Yeah, there's an obvious answer here. One of them is... In a, I'll tell you in a story. No, yeah, please do. And then I'll tell you about myself. Here it is. I like the Beatles. We've talked about them, right? Yeah. And the Beatles, most people know, they're good at writing songs about love. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Right? John Lennon's good at writing a song about how he loves a woman. Hmm? Mm-hmm. And the way that I came to understand that through a documentary or through a book or something was that, in fact, he he wasn't any good at loving women at one time. Cheated. Mm. Maybe did some stuff that wasn't good. I don't know the actual details of his yeah. love life. But I came to hear that he wasn't that good at it. Right? But he wrote songs for what he wanted and what he aspired to be. And you could call that hypocritical, but I don't really think it is. It's really like I'm looking for something more. Yeah. So if I were to tell you what I'm hypocritical about, it would rest in the first question. And it would say, the thing I never want to be associated with mm. is inner constriction. Mm-hmm. Right? It'd be hypocritical for me to put on a show for you and not tell you that at one time... I was the most psychologically constricted person that I knew. That my mind absolutely had turned on itself and tried to do me in. That is a place that I sometimes... I don't forget about it. But I don't remind people of it either. Yeah. So there's, some, there's something hypocritical in there. And, and, and I really want to reframe that and say not hypocritical... But I suffered enough in a particular area to make me never want to go there again. Yeah. But it still comes out. Right? Yeah. So, so that's almost not hypocritical. It just means there's work to be done still in that, maybe. Well, it, it's it's like you're saying, sometimes I step into my old selves or, I, sure. you know, and um, yeah, that kind of inner critic. My inner critics are alive and well. If you work a, a meditation practice... You know that you never are going to arrive at a place where you're not critical. It's never going to happen. A monk meditating for 40 years is still meditating every day. Yeah. Because the, it never ends. Yeah. Your brain doesn't end. So it's hypocritical for me to put on some kind of air like, you know, I've arrived and I'm okay with all of these thoughts. No, no, no. There's daily garbage that's got to be taken out for me every morning every morning i have a practice where if i don't take this garbage out now it'll it'll take about five days for my brain to start turning in a negative way and it's subtle but it does yeah so i'm a bit hypocritical about that absolutely 
Yeah, that's interesting, man. I work Which, it though, so I'm, you know. Yeah, right. No, you're doing the work. I guess in a way, as you were talking, I get sometimes when people talk and they start telling me things like this, I get these pictures in my head, and I'll tell you what I'm thinking of as you're talking is like a man who's been in prison since he was maybe young, right? And he's an old man now, and he's in prison, and he paints paintings of the ocean and the beach and the mountains, and people judging this man and saying why are you painting that you have you don't you've never been to those places but he wants to mm-hmm. and so is it that to, it's kind of like the john lennon story it's what you're that's what i thought of is like john lennon yeah he sings about love but he obviously he's got problem relationship problems he maybe isn't always so loving we're all like that to some degree but should i not the painting of it is the desire to want it. This guy in prison wants the ocean. Yeah. He wants the mountains. He wants the sea. He wants the freedom of the air. That's right. It's like John and Fogarty, that's why, yeah. Creedence Clearwater guy, writes about the swamp, lives in California. Yeah. Same deal. Yeah. You want it, so it's a way for you to give to, to, to reach for it. Yeah. You know, just because you're in the prison doesn't mean you shouldn't paint the painting. Maybe I'm dodging the question. Did I dodge the question? I don't think so. I think it's these questions sometimes what I have found, they meander into other territory and I like that sometimes because they're stimulators, you know? I guess maybe I'm hypocritical about admitting my own shortcomings because mm. I can't seem to find one. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, gosh. I think for me, the, if I had to just quickly say for me being the, my biggest hypocritical thing would be probably the sin of busyness and I I, oh. I I say it all the time because i i will stand on the rooftops with fists clenched tightly and say everybody needs to stop acting this way slow down we have to be in the present moment everyone should pay attention to what's happening in front of them hurry up the, and get there yeah and the whole time i fully admit that come monday morning at eight o'clock i'm gonna have deadlines piled on top of me and I'm going to step right into the same clock everybody else is. Mm. And then I'll pat myself on the back and go, well, at least I'm aware I'm in the clock. <laughs> you know? That's my big... I mean, That it's is a, something. That's hypocritical. And I mean, that's my... I promise you that well, is my number one We haven't done awareness hypocrisy. a very good justice today, but awareness, <laughs> awareness is definitely essential. To, to have awareness and then decide I'm not going to do anything about it, obviously it's no good. But if you don't have awareness, you don't even have an option. Yeah, so, right. So that's that is absolutely necessary to change. Mm. Absolutely necessary. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Knowing just it's anything i mean you know anybody who's done a made a bonsai tree or like you know what you know formed bamboo or anything like that over a long period of time knows that it's small little changes you make and mm-hmm. bending and twisting and just waiting and mm-hmm. it, it takes work and it takes time i mean i think that we live in a culture where everybody wants it now and it's like i, I can i can fully imagine and i don't know this but somebody going i'm gonna sign up for a meditation class i'm gonna go meditate mm-hmm. and then walking away and going I got the same damn problems I had before I went into that class. That doesn't work. Mm. And then throwing it away and not understanding that it's not, it's a bonsai tree or it's a vine. It's not, it needs to be tended to, Mm -hmm. you know, I don't know. I think maybe perhaps just the culture of our, the way we live, it's just sort of a cloudiness, a Mm -hmm. smog, Mm -hmm. you know, and I hope that it can change. I do. But it's going to take a lot of just folks trying to make little tiny changes collectively to and wash it out sure. slowly. Pain has great value. Yeah, that's a hopeful thought. It is. <laughs> I hope some. I hope people listen to this and, and get that out of this. I really do because that's a and it, it does. It ties back to other conversations that this show has had, and I'm glad you challenged some of those things too because it's worth. That's the point, mm-hmm. you know, is going into that territory and learning something you know mm-hmm. not just echo chamber i mean now i won't lie i've enjoyed this conversation because it uh i found a lot of common ground or a lot of similarities and a lot of what you're saying and things that i've just tried to explore in my life so it's, it's nice to it's sort of validating okay. i guess to yeah. some degree so in that regard i've enjoyed this quite a bit and then just learned a lot too hmm. I, I, I don't know so that I want other people to go listen to your music and 
learn about you? How do they find you? Hmm. Um, in what regard? Music, counseling. I mean, I'm assuming um, as far as counseling goes that you – there's a process for that, I'm assuming, to – yeah i mean i work for family and youth okay, counseling agency. right we didn't talk about that but okay um you know so that's where they'd go if they want to seek seek counseling yeah and, and really that's a great place to seek counseling um i used to go to counseling there mm-hmm. years ago oh my gosh there's incredible counselors there it's like number one or number two favorite thing about working there is me having access to the other counselors who work there yeah it is so cool i mean they are amazing um so if there's anybody out there who's looking for counseling it's an incredible place to go um absolutely do it my thing about counseling is to say it's a place where you go to get something you want get rid of something you don't want who doesn't want that (laughs) yeah that's pretty that's nice. My, that's I like that. Easy sell on counseling. You know? It's a place to go to get something you want and get rid of something you don't want. Or get rid of something you don't want. And who doesn't want that? Doesn't? Boy, that's is that not the new slogan for family and youth counseling right there? I, now, I have not run that by the board. <laughs> no. That is that is that, Paul, that was pretty well written. I like that. That is yeah, so <laughs> I'm that is not approved by the board or my director. <laughs> I'm not, we'll asterisk that. Yeah, we'll asterisk that. That's one of Paul's <laughs> things. But um, no, it's it's an absolutely incredible place, and um, I don't know what else to say. I would encourage I encourage everybody to go to counseling. It's just incredible. It's just incredible. You can get anything you want in counseling. Absolutely believe that. Um, well, so many people aren't talking to somebody else, or maybe nobody's listening. You know, mm-hmm. and it's just be- the beginning of things begins there. I mean. We need a mirrors. I mean, mm. not just mirrors, but human mirrors. I really believe it's essential. Yeah. I mean, so that that's a good place to go um, for counseling. If you're looking for crybaby stuff, we're on Instagram. We're on Facebook. Uh, we have a show February 16th at Mellow Mushroom. Oh, right on. Okay. Yeah. That's our next show. So. Oh, that's fun. We're super. I want to go to that. I haven't oh, got to man. see y'all live yet. Yeah, and I like Mellow thing. Mushroom, too, so that's cool. Mm-hmm. Two things I love. Yeah. Chris Sherman experience. I play guitar with them. Um, he kind of changes members every now and then, but but we have a show December 29th, which would be, I think, this Next, Friday. Next, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is that Friday? Mm, let's see. 25th is Tuesday, so Friday or Saturday? One of those days, 29th. And uh, I think Mickey Smith Jr. is going to be there. Oh, right on. Shredding. So that'll be great. Um, (laughs) So if you want to do that, you can do that, too. That's awesome, man. Anything else? No, man. That's it. This has been a great... I think it's been a great episode. I hope... For me, it has. I hope somebody else finds it good, too. Yeah, I don't know about that, but I had a great time. Uh, Really? (laughs) Oh, good, man. Well, look. I mean, one hand... I mean, we could have just sat here and caught up because I haven't seen you in years, but... uh, disturbing a number of years now that i think about it that i mean really five years is a long time yeah but it, i don't know man just it was easy uh i, I you're a fast friend yeah it was i like that. i really yeah. enjoyed it i didn't know you would be so i mean i listened to a few episodes but you seem to be like really deep deeply rooted in some other like eastern spirituality type stuff yeah cool. it doesn't come up so much mm-hmm. uh we can live in a predominantly christian community community yeah. and that's there's i don't say that to mean that that's a bad thing i just um i've had i have a foot in both worlds man me too. i mean me too and i'm i've learned to be okay with that it's not okay with other folks and i've learned to be okay with that too it's okay too you know because whenever someone's ultimately where the rubber meets the road for me is when somebody shows up in that door whoever it may be and a lot of people come through that door man for this whether it's a customer and sometimes just random strangers most of the time the 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 need has is a listener oh my gosh i just want somebody to listen to him gosh and it's the greatest i i uh, yeah we could talk for days but if you can listen to someone really like really give them your attention is that not just one of the greatest gifts you can give someone Mm -hmm. right 
Somebody told me this, and it's, uh, and I, I was like, huh. He, he said, one day I was at a prayer event that I had organized, and I couldn't, I just cry, man. I told my, I told somebody there, I said, if I'm not crying, I'm not praying. Hmm. Just that's me. Because when people start praying for the things that they hurt, I cry. Hmm. And it's not because I'm sad. I don't know why. I just cry for them. And he came up to me at the end and he said, when you cry for these people, he said, may I see you cry? And again, I'm not saying this. I don't, I don't want this to sound pretentious. So, okay. <laughs> but he says, when you cry for people, man, he said, I feel like God's crying for them. Mm-hmm. He's, it's his way of letting them know, I see you. Care about I you. care about you. I see you. You're mm-hmm. cared for. You're loved. And I take that. I took that away from that. Not to say, oh, I'm somebody special. No, no, no. I was like. It's so important for people to just be seen and loved. I mean, just plainly. Right. Just plainly. Just they don't have to do anything for it. And what I have found more than anything in this show and then people who come through the door randomly, I see that as a very deeply spiritual moment. Even if we never talk about Christianity, Buddhism, or the mystery things. Totally agree. I just listen to them when we talk, and then they want to know that they matter, man, that they're seen and heard, and they just exist for a reason. Uh, if their reason is only to sit in that chair and feel loved for just a minute, and a lot of people just don't feel loved, man. Right. And it really, that stings me. Well, I appreciate you doing the work. Hey, you're doing the work, too. I'm really thankful that you came on here and shared everything that you shared. Like you said, I didn't know where the territory was. Kind of, yeah. Yeah. It was the Wild West, and we went all over, but I... I um, so glad to be here. Thanks for yeah. having me. Anytime. It's really cool. I love you just...